this is a uh, Chris and Jared, and I think I think technically we're trying to do a part three to the last two that we just did, but uh, <laughs> it's because we didn't we didn't solve it, and now we got to solve it. But so what are we doing? Solving atheism? Or... Yeah, solving <laughs> solving all philosophy and atheism. Was it was it mean to solve atheism? We convert all the atheisms the atheists to theists. Is that what we're it's doing? Got... It's got to go one way or the other. It doesn't matter which. All right. I guess we're missionaries now. Yeah. Full circle. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. It's important to, uh, when you're a missionary, that you kind of just don't have all the answers. So you just <laughs> pretend like you do. You that's just how you, that's how you bury your testimony. No, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, was, I was thinking about one of the things that we talked about earlier today. And I, cause I had asked in, in one of those previous episodes, like, what is it that sucks about all of these cliche atheist answers or uh, criticisms of theism? And because it, it can't just be that it's old cause old things are nev not bad by virtue of being old. And I'm, I'm thinking maybe the answer is, is that at one point it was new. And if the only thing that made it appeal to us is that it was new, then it, that doesn't make it good. And once the newness wears off, that's if that's all it had, then it doesn't have anything anymore. And I was thinking that because I went back and I re-listened to one of my favorite Hitchens debates. And it was it was Hitch versus David Berlinski, who is a weird and interesting dude. Have you ever listened to him? I listened to every one of Hitch's debates at least three times. So I know I don't know which one you're talking about, but if you start going, it'll probably ring up to me so berlinski just to give you an idea of who he is he's he's got like a, a doctorate in math or something i he's he's a mathematician anyway there, there's at one point in his debate with hitchens where they get to the q a section and and somebody asks hitchens what are the weaknesses of pascal's wager and he goes on his big hitchens speech and then they ask Berlinski, the reverse question, like, what are the strengths of Pascal's wager? And he goes, there are none. And then, like, he doesn't even <laughs> elaborate at all, and they kind of laughed at it. But he's very, he's, like, not religious at all. But the point of their debate was, does atheism poison everything? Oh, was, I, I think I know that. Well, that's kind of generally Hitch's thing. What's his name? David Berlinski? David Berlinski. He's got a lot of weird stuff, because he, like... One of his big things was doubting the the narrative of evolution. Not like saying that evolution didn't happen, but saying that the way that you guys said it happened didn't happen. I don't know. He's a he's a weird dude, but I don't remember that debate. But I for sure watched it. I was, I was. It was a pretty a good debate, fans. and no, I, yeah, I know. I and I still love him. It's just that like I was going over this debate, and a lot of his answers they seemed really cool to me, like you know, eight years ago or whatever, but like now it's, it's just stuff like, like his argument of how big the universe is, right? He'll, he'll be like, like, oh, you live in this, uh, I can't do Hitch inside. <laughs> you, you live in this, like, like just tiny, do a little, British accent. this tiny little backwater planet on a <laughs> insignificant yeah, no, see, galaxy. You just sound like a Star Wars villain. That's not Hitch. I, know, I, I sound like Grand Moff Tarkin. Um, it's like you, you live in this tiny little blue planet in this backwater insignificant galaxy and there's millions of stars going out every second that I'm talking right now and and you think that like God listens to you and I remember him saying that and I remember being impressed with that when I was younger and now I'm like wait a minute yeah that's their exact argument that's exactly what the Christians are saying like and that's that's I remember being told that you know growing up that like not even in regards to the universe, just in regards to the world. Like, look at how huge everything is and how amazing everything is. And like these big mountains and the sky, and you can look up and see the stars and it's beautiful. And out of all that, God cares specifically about you. So when Hitchens brings that up as if it's supposed to refute Christianity or theism in general, you just, I don't know. <laughs> You're just like, oh, yeah, that's what they were saying. Well, see, there's part of it that I think that Hitchens across the years, in a little bit of the same way Dan Dennett does, because I pulled up Dennett and put a clip of him in there after we talked about it, because Dennett, I would say, backed off of the the super anti-theism 
I had the clip in there and it was Michael Shermer who introduced him in that meeting. And both of them were talking about, okay, hold on here. Wait, let's look at this as an evolutionary process, not just as virus or um, I said this earlier, it's spandrel. Spandrel is the concept of a byproduct of evolution that was just accidental. You know, like, yeah. I don't know, some people might say something like a, that part of your intestine that might blow up. The appendix? Uh, yeah, your appendix or something like that. The, that's not even quite what a spandrel is. It's, it's, a hard, yeah. it's kind of a hard concept to define. If you look the word up, it's an architectural thing. And it's the name for a shape that comes about from having two arches. So it's not a thing you build. You don't build mm -hmm. a spandrel. You end up with a spandrel by designing yeah, it's accidental. arches. And some people yeah. think language itself is a spandrel. You know, like it was accidental that we're even sitting here cognating and talking and making up all these abstractions to, yeah. to, to mess ourselves up. Hmm. And There's a uh, lot of that in the in um, selfish gene. We're talking about Dawkins, or we're talking yeah. about Hitch. But... Well, we're talking about Hitch. We're talking about. I guess I guess we're talking about kind of just Hitch, Hitch yeah, Dawkins. Well, it's all just. Did you watch the last two ones that, that we put up? Um, bits. I haven't gotten through all of them. I started both <laughs> um, of them. Did you watch the one to, the one today again? I Jared? got through some of it. Or I Jared. It today. I got about halfway through it because I just added I added some clips and I partially had to add some clips because. Jared and I were winging it. We were winging it kind of late, and and when you put so... in that, uh, that loaf of bread cart. <laughs> that like it's one of those things where it's like I that had completely left my memory, and then like <laughs> a, like a thousand of those just oh there they are. It's like taking out the spellers <laughs> of my mind. I'm like oh my god, I have thousands of this memory. Opened up the archive. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah uh, um, totally. I don't even know why I put that in there. I I, be, I keep putting Muppet <laughs> stuff in there <laughs> just for like intro. Uh, I was so of... <laughs> delighted. By that. But I, I, uh, that might be kind of a brilliant thing, you know, in the sense of because like. It's like Plinkett talks about how, like, you know, he wrote his original critique of a Star Trek Generations, and he recorded it in his voice, and he's like, this is just a fucking book report. Yeah. And so he came up with, like, oh, I'm going to make a weird character, and I'm going to make this guy a, a horrible person, <laughs> and, and I'm going to create, you know, and those little distractions, actually, you know, they make sense. You know, like in yeah, a class, jar to like, head every out, once in then... a while, you just need to you need to break the flow to put everybody to remind everybody what you were talking about. Yeah, well, but, is a great character too. Yeah, I was. They uh, they just had a thing this week where they talked about that movie Prey. Yeah, I watched I, the movie Prey, and I no. think they're kind of, uh, I think they're kind of backing off their old ways of saying that stuff is crap because they know that there's kind of too many eyes on them from 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 the access <laughs> well, media. I Not saying they did a hundred percent, but I think they definitely curb off of how harsh they used to be on I've, I've heard a lot of people I haven't watched it but I've heard a lot of people that said they thought it was gonna suck ended up kind of liking it I don't it's, know I don't think it's total woke trash at all like most people are saying but yeah. it definitely is kind of just like a crappy spin -off. it's a crappy sequel just it's like the other crappy movie. sequels yeah. well because like I mean everybody wants the narrative to be there of like oh it's just woke trash but the, this is the thing about this it. is like well, maybe there is, but because even going all the way back to the beginning of this whole thing, the argument was never stop turning our heroes into girls, necessarily. It's like, at least make them good, believable characters. And I haven't watched this movie, but the general reviews, even from people who you expect would hate it, have said, you know, like you said, we expected it to be woke trash, and it wasn't that bad, which sounds fine. Because, like, you know, like in the, and in the plink, or not the plink, of the red letter media reviews, you know, they talk. They touch on that where it's like you know they they give the girl a backstory they show her training she, and learning they and give she her, wins and um, she doesn't win yeah. by being from being a man and all that sorts of stuff yeah. i'd say the only stuff that's kind of obvious wokeness is like some pre-columbian tribe and the girls going around and now announcing to the pre-columbian tribe like i'm just as good, good as the boys or or, yeah. or i want to be a hunter because i can be a hunter or something like that it's it's well, it's just got some 2020 in this too, the way she... I mean, I guess, but again, though, because, like, you know, I, I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, just because cause just because it's topically weird means that you should stay away from it. Because, like, again, no, it's, if you it's, can tell it's that fine, story really. well, believably, and with good characters, God so there bless was a, 
well, there's, a, there's a movie that just came out called The Duel. Do you guys see The Duel? No. I haven't. It's about. It's oh, I got, saw I saw a, a trailer of it, and I laughed, and I laughed. But that's all I remember about it's it. It's a it's a pretty good movie, and it's actually Is based on some true history oh, from the France. The trailer looked like like three hundred trash. It just looks so stupid. <laughs> no, it's good, and actually, even like the fight scenes in it are oh. so true to the era. That they oh, they'll oh. you'll be like wow this is really amazing the way that this uh, jousting fight just turned into an all out ugly brawl and not like cool sword fighting at all. Yeah. Um, well, it yeah, actually like comes from about, a um, true story. It was a true story from France that there's. I went and looked it up afterwards. There strangely is a lot documented on this story, and it's about a woman who claimed another aristocrat raped her, and um, her husband was an aristocrat. And there's all this weird backstory to it. Like nobody knows who, is, who exactly was right or not. And the woman said that the guy, one guy did does it. Does it have a Rashomon element to the rape? Is that well, it's, it, it does, a, it might be a deep cut for me. What, but the, uh, Rashomon, uh, you know, Rashomon is the, it's the Japanese, it's the Kurosawa movie. And it's oh, yeah. in ancient times. Yeah. And it's mm. about the, uh, there's a woodsman, the noble, his wife and the bandit. And it's yeah. the story of a rape and murder, and it's told from the stories of the four participants. And everybody's stories are mutually yes, exclusive. yes, yeah. It, it absolutely does that. It does yeah. like everybody's kind of believe. Every story versions. makes sense and is believable, and yeah. none of them can be true without excluding and all it's, the others. And it's very well done and good with that. And strangely enough, based in the actual history, if you look up the history of the huh. story, and it's pretty good. Huh. And then the one Maybe thing where you go. That. Yeah, it's if good. somebody if it's they had good. picked this as a Rashomon remake, I would have watched it. It is a Rashomon remake based in. A Rashomon story, a Rashomon huh. history, like the history's huh. Rashomon, and oh. so there really is the multiple sides of it back in the weird is it French history. By from a like scene of a priest, I forget the year, having and a it's... conversation about the nature of existence. Oh, <laughs> well, well, we'll do that to it, but yeah, it sort of does. But the uh, it talks about perception and all that sorts of stuff, and then it's got the element in it of this was a time frame that people thought who won the fight had bearing on who was correct. That's a whole thing about the history of like the first few decades of Islam after the death of Muhammad. Like mm -hmm. part of the whole Shia Sunni split, there's a third group called Harajit and or well, so it gets confusing because the Abadis come from the same group as the Harajits, but they don't like being associated with them. But anyway, because like the there's a whole thing, it was, it's all, all Games of Thrones stuff. The whole Shia, Su, Sunni Shia split comes down to one group said no we shouldn't negotiate another group said no it's okay to negotiate and the third group said no we should fight because if we just fight then a lot will be with whoever yeah, whoever yeah. wins that's who god is with it's that simple and, and that's they, the law that's the law and the rule of the time in the french and you can so much of this like i might i like it because it's not there's not too much hollywooding in a weird way that you would kind of think ah oh, they kind of hollywooded that but then they still woke it a little bit. And it all just comes down to one little speech by the lady where she's obviously talking in 2020 terms. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. like, and that's just one little speech. You can even overlook that one little speech, but you just kind of got to be like, why put the one, one little speech in there that puts it, that, that makes you think yeah. of 2020 politics, you know? No, it's like perfect analog. Like what, cause we always talk about how this stuff is all exactly like religion. Exactly like any outside observer reading the Book of Mormon who knows anything about contemporary history and culture in America at that time, reads the Book of Mormon and goes like, oh, he's just doing a drama. It's a period piece, but it's it's like Star Trek, but Joseph Smith style. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, I'm going to take contemporary issues and I'm going to set them in another time and a place. You know, and it's like, and it's obvious from an outsider, like, it's obvious. We see you doing it. And that's the thing about all this woke stuff was like, when you interject, it's like, no asshole. That wasn't a 14th century concern. You know, and it's but. a bit like that with prey. Like they, they, I, they could have gone to a point all the way where I would have agreed all the way with red letter media, but there's just like a little bit too. I mean, not, I'm not saying don't, well, I'm saying don't watch prey cause it's just a crappy predator sequel, but, um, That's a good it's, enough reason not to watch yeah, <laughs> but the wokeness of it is just in little bits like that. And so it's like, not like enough yeah. for you to say, I'll get rid of this, but it's just kind of these little things that you kind of wish like, just make that a little bit more like a pre-Columbian story, like about you'd really believe yeah. it was happening in that moment, and you you could have done it. But the same the same thing with the duel, and I highly recommend duel. Watch, watch duel because uh, Ben Affleck and and uh, the dude who was in Star Wars, and they all do really good jobs. I have to narrow that one down a bit. 
The last, the, dude who, the, the last dude who Star played Wars movies. Adam Driver. The cast of the last Adam movie, Driver. Last Star Wars. Oh, he is good. He's good. He's yeah. way the cast good. was ridiculous. Too many, there are too many characters in that dumb show. And what's true is like, th- there's there's an honest side to that side that that guy said it was a false rape claim to take his land and to defame him. And then there's the o- other side of it where there's an obvious rape claim. And you think maybe because of modern terms, they're going to kind of hint at, well, the woman was telling the truth. Well, so, so, but I think they just, I don't think they bang you over the head with that. But well, that ruins the, the the whole mystery of it, wouldn't it? There is. Well, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't want to br- br- break it for you, but there's no answer. Yeah, you, you know. Yeah, I, I didn't think the there would be, and that's yeah. well, if if they had done the believe all women thing, there would have to be an answer. And I, I mm-hmm. assume that there's all these conflicting narratives. They don't want to give an answer. So I think they just get to that. But there, this is a real pre-modern times where it says this guy's got a claim to having a false rape accusation against him for for very nefarious purposes because he had wealth and and he could they could make a claim on that wealth for him for it and this raises something i don't mean i don't want to totally derail you but this is something i've been wanting to talk about if there's any place for us to talk about it and it's kind of tangential but kind of topical the whole roe v wade decision and this whole idea because like i mean i'm not opposed to it it makes enough sense to me but this idea that like even you know the people who are even um the pro-life side the standard pro-life thing is like, well, we make an exception for rape, among other things. How is that possibly going to work in reality? Like, yeah. oh, you just because you, you're just gonna get people just, saying I was raped. Like, do you do you literally? Yeah, there's no good way every to single one that. of these. What's the standard of evidence gonna be? You know, like, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's literally it's, everybody who it's wants a an totally abortion. Un, it's, just... it's a totally unfeasible policy. Sure. Like, it just it, well, it's it, yeah, it either make a. It would either make justice into a farce or a nightmare. Like, those are the options. Well, part of the problem with it is that if, like, the whole pro-life stance is that, like, you think that this being is a human being with rights. And there's no other circumstance under which, like, it's... So if it's the same thing as a baby, there's no other circumstances under which it's okay to kill a baby. Like... Like, you could argue, like, if there's a mom that's in a life-and-death situation, she saved herself over the baby, then she's not going to be prosecuted for that. But, like, if if a woman is raped and she kills her born baby because she's raped, she's going to be prosecuted for yeah. killing her born baby. Absolutely. So, like, so it, it doesn't... <gasps> there most is of the doggo. people Sorry, total disgrace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> most of the people that I've seen, they'll sort of... They'll say, like, look, I couldn't look a woman who was raped and pregnant in the face and say that this is a baby and it deserves a chance i think yeah. it's probably the right thing to do to have the baby but i couldn't tell her to do that so that's why i would make that exception and it was a recent debate it was a debate that you showed me with the richard spencer being the pro-choice shot side yeah it's so weird. that's what the, that's what the other guy said richard spencer, pro-choice endorsed joe biden oh hell yeah he's <laughs> And they, just funny, he's, like, he's a Dixie Crat. People, he's a Dixie like, Crat. <laughs> all the people that agree with Richard Spencer at who accuse me of being on the alt right. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's look at let's look at our records, okay? Let's <laughs> tell me lay out all your opinions for me, and then I'll go find a wiki page with all of Richard Spencer's opinions. Let's see who lines up more you- with Richard Spencer. Did you read the comments? How many guys were like, how dare you make me agree with Richard Spencer? <laughs> I, did. I didn't. I, I meant to. I watched like I saw some of them. 45 minutes of that. And it's God, it's it's funny to watch because he's like he's like agreeing with the, the pro-choice side, but from like an angle that acknowledges all of the terrible parts of it. Like, because he's I don't know. You'll get all these lefty pro-choicers being like, "Oh, it's it's such an amazing thing that black people are, you know, utilizing this amazing freedom that they have to to abort. It's amazing that they have that." And Richard Spencer is saying, "I'm so glad that all these black people are killing their babies, yeah. so there's less black people." You know and... what Martin Luther King's <laughs> daughter has been up to for fifty years? Mm-mm. She. Like I first heard this 25 years ago listening to conservative talk radio, but she is like a, an, a, conspiracy, a conspiracist who, is say, who has been saying for decades in an argument that is 100% critical race theory 
um, compliant, it nests perfectly, but says that Planned Parenthood and pro-choice is a secret anti-black genocide being perpetrated by white supremacists. Yeah, they put like, they the, back the, to Margaret, Margaret yeah. Singer and all like, that stuff. Yeah, that, like, oh, it's they're only pretending like this is about women's rights. Really, they're just trying to stop blacks from having more babies. And more, like, this has been her they'll point to stuff like decades. more black babies were shit. aborted in New York, yeah, last year than were born. I didn't know yeah. that. And, and uh, I, I mean, I if if there's any place where they might have a point to that, they might have a point to that in there. Well, they might um, have a point with Margaret Sanger. I don't think that's what it is that like, I don't, yeah, there, there's, think not there's some this cabal of oh, no. pro choicers that are like, it's I'm so because I think those anti-natalists don't care about the race that they're no, about. No, I think no, they no. want them all aborted. No, yeah, so to, sure. so with your with your whole thing about red letter media, I'd say there's two things I got. Um, with red letter media, they've been going easier on all movies lately, and I don't think it has anything to do with people watching them. I think they've just lowered their standards. Well, <laughs> like, yeah, oh, yeah, like yeah. according no, no, I too. think they raised. I think it's the opposite. I think they raised their standards. Is there's like the whole bat. The Batman thing movie, where they're like, like they how, we're not going to watch they didn't, it unless they just you. Said, like, how many, how many times can we say oh. it's a competent but for, forgettable film? You know, sure, which is true. I, when I meant, when like, I say Lord, well, I think what they, he's saying is that like, like, like when they watch they something, they're not it. expecting anything great ever again. So well, like it's that. it's almost at the end of every episode, they'll be like, "Do you recommend this movie?" And Mike, lately, Mike has just been like, eh, "Yeah, why not?" And because he's watching there, his favorite I th thing just die. I do think they're and overly aware of getting Jay will always the... Jay will always be like, really? And he's like, yeah, because why not? I mean, compared to the rest of the superhero movies, this was all right. But yeah. then the other thing with Prey, and I haven't watched it yet, I'd say that I always separate these two different parts of wokeness, right? I'd say there's woke business practices and woke agenda. And... They mesh quite often, but like what business practices right. would be hiring. It's clunky and inaccurate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's hiring the the diversity hire. That's easier to ignore because you can still like, if you can suspend your disbelief that this woman could beat the shit out of like 20 trained men, then you can get something out of the well, story. That's... But if the woke agenda is in there, then it, it totally ruins it. And one of the best recent examples I've seen of this is in... It, I got it for free, the Avengers video game, and it's just oh, yeah. really fucking bad. And and it has some woke agenda in there, but part of it is also the woke business practices because there's only like five or six, seven, I don't know, characters that you can play as, and they add one every now and then. And one of the first ones they added was Hawkeye. And I imagine if I gave a shit about this game, I'd be like, awesome, I can play as Hawkeye now. Like, it's corny, he shoots arrows, but whatever. And then right after that, they added girl Hawkeye. And what? I'd be like, okay, like, I already have Hawkeye. If you wanted him to be a girl, like, you're wasting a character slot here. And then just recently, they added girl Thor. And I'm like, I, I, I'm not going to play this anymore because I'm already bored of it. But, like, I'm, I imagine the move set is exactly the same. Again, this is a character slot that you're wasting with your woke business practices because you got to add girl Hawkeye and girl Thor for no good reason. Yeah. But Jared, you have an optics problem here because I barely even understand this stuff. But I hope I'm not mistaken. But isn't Captain America a DC product? And you've got his shield directly above your head as you're shitting on Marvel. So, <laughs> yeah, that's a, just... Marvel. That's a in a Nietzschean he... way. We see we see what your biases are. <laughs> Yeah, oh, Cap just, Captain like, America's see? Marvel. Oh, is it? Yeah, Did yeah. I get it wrong? Yeah. I see. This is how we did I know get it wrong. Was... That's true. Oh, <laughs> I thought Captain. Why did I think he was a? What was the Civil War about? That see, was in that. Yeah. This is the what thing I'm talking about. Is like I have watched. I watched uh, Black Panther once, and I watched Thor Ragnarok once. But I have watched the Red Letter Media review of Civil War <laughs> like five times. <laughs> My I, uh, favorite was probably Batman versus Superman, or any of their Star Wars ones were pretty great. But yeah, like that's all my Marvel experience really is like because I barely understand it. See, I should have caught right off. I should have caught right off that that was Marvel too. But you, you oh, so now it's even better. Like, so you're just a Marvel. It works both ways though, because if it was a DC <laughs> thing, oh. 
you're just shilling for DC. If it is, it's a Marvel. Yeah, we thing. could do it. We so could. It just looks like, oh, well, Captain America has been ruined. But he has that. Boy. He has that great quote where, and I think they lifted a little bit of it from Mark Twain, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. And it's during the comic Civil War, and they use the quote a little bit in the Civil War, where everyone's telling Captain America he's wrong, and he's basically saying like, you know, he, he says like compromise where you can but where you can't compromise don't and it's it's this grand quote where he goes like like even when the entire world and and the press and the media are all conspiring against you if they're right if they're wrong and you're right it is your moral obligation as an american to plant your your feet in the soil like a tree of truth or some shit like that and say no you move world or whatever it's this big awesome thing and you're swirling horns that is a that is a cool thing it actually ties back to to i'll I'll show it to you at some point but it's so like it's enraging because now they've ruined captain america and that's the whole reason i liked him in the first place well i mean that's things like the idea of woke captain america i mean i barely know anything about it but i know enough to know that like captain america is like a human representation of like american patriotism and and the best values well, that, that america that, and those things are all anathema to wokeism that civil like, war is kind of a perfect tie-in bad. though that civil yeah. war is kind of a perfect tie-in about how you moral axioms and all that stuff it's almost kind of like a perfect tie-in of deontology versus utilitarianism and you know um iron man wants to wants to save the world through the great big technocratic ideas and and well and... that's the whole that's the age of ultron the second avengers movie is he actually uses the phrase i want to like i want to coat the world in armor <laughs> yeah he's so he's the great big uh people lose freedoms for safety yeah and no Captain that was so america if you, if you go back Captain to america in... is the no freedom freedom first type i stuff. remember there was this it's, specifically it's, it's, this it's, it's, are the two items there's nerf the world versus um protect teach the world yeah to, and, and it's it's the two like, good guys that have the clashing axioms which which i've always told you is why i think um watchmen's such a good series because it's really really a good focus on the clashing axioms but the reason why civil war was one of the best um marvel movies is because it was all about clashing axioms between two good guys who's right between these two moralities which does go in line. See, honestly, my I think my favorite clash was in Infinity War because that's, and they needed to focus more on Captain America because you got Captain America and Thanos who have these clashing ideologies, and it's basically just individualism versus collectivism. If you actually watch the thing, it's it's great. And I brought this up in a movie group on Facebook that was specifically an ex Mormon movie group. I don't know why I brought it up because they hate individualism so like i got shot down by a lot of people because they were saying that there's the part where one of the infinity stones that thanos is looking for is in vision's forehead and so they say well if we kill vision he just can't win and captain america's response to that is we don't trade lives and he, that's we don't negotiate with terrorists is what he's saying and so he was still pretty true to his character right there and like Thanos trades lives. His whole plan is like kill 50% of life to save the other 50%. Like it's it's maximizing happiness. Yeah, yeah, he is like a pure utilitarian. It's morality He's a acts pure in the consequentialist. Same way. And Captain America is like a pure deontologist where we don't trade lives. It is That's where acting. comics, whenever comics hits that stuff on the head. It's kind of the same thing with Daredevil and Punisher. Well, the problem is right? I got accused of racism, though, over that, because this guy's <laughs> like, well, oh, well, you seem to ignore all of the Wakandan soldiers' lives that Captain America was willing to trade. He's like, no, he wasn't trading them. They were fighting, you fucking idiot. <laughs> like, they're... Yeah, they had either, a fight. It's like their, either their roll control over was in the their own hands. Yeah. You either roll over for the terrorists and say, okay, take what you want, or you die fighting. And, like, how do you not understand that that's a better option? And it's also, like, it's, it's a trolley problem, but the trolley problem's not a perfect trolley problem because in one scenario, uh, the people, the person's actually tied to the tracks. In the other scenario, the people where the train's coming at, they all have a fighting chance themselves to try to fight the train, if that makes sense. So, like, some are going to die, but you don't know which ones. that They have some free will or some, some of their own control in their hands because they're the ones fighting. Um, but 
any one of those superhero movies. I mean, Alan Moore was so good at it. And, you know, most of those other different writers. I was going to show you guys a picture because you remember I, I talked to you guys about Milkshake Gate, which is that, that time where they showed like all the women who were currently editing and writing at, um, at uh, what you might call oh, it, yeah, I think at yeah. Marvel or something like that. Oh, it used yeah, to be Alan Moore. The room. It used to be Alan Moore. And who's the guy who wrote uh, The Killing Game for the Joker and all that stuff, who wrote these really deep, detailed, kind of clashing axiom uh, concepts of, of, I think he was even in on Civil War and stuff like that. What's his name? Um, the guy who wrote the DC stuff. Anyway, I know who you're talking about. They're insanely, they're insanely good writers. And if you look at them, they're, they're like you'd expect them to be weird old hermits with like long scraggly beards who almost kind of look like wizards. It's like, it's a bit like J.R. Tolkien or, or Frank or, Miller. Frank Miller. Yeah. And uh, now they say, well, what's going on with all these comics? All these comics stink. And that, that milkshake gate picture came out and it showed all these different people who are writing now for it. And, and not to say that because of people's uh, identities or appearances, you know what sort of story you're going to get, but it kind of holds true there. Uh, I'll well, put a picture I, I of always, milkshake it up, but I have a picture just like that to show you guys. Go ahead and talk. I'm gonna, well, so I, right. I always use it. And I always think of in terms of like bands, because I've, I remember we did this, we went to Provo to do this battle of the bands one time at Valor. And the band that ended up winning it was a girl band, right? And mm -hmm. it's because it's because their front woman was stellar. She was amazing in every way. Oh, yeah? She was good at crowd work. She was a phenomenal singer, everything. But the rest of the band was not very good, especially mm -hmm. the drummer. And mm -hmm. I remember seeing that and being like, this is the problem with seeking out a girl band. You're just... You're limiting yourself. You so you just like, had the girl singer with other good players. That we... I have. Well, a you just have good him. players. You have you have good players. Mm -hmm. That's what you have. And if you find a front woman that's amazing, you pull her in. If you find a woman who is like the best drummer you've ever heard, you pull her into the band. But like, if you say we're well, only going to go with women drummers, and there's like one woman drummer and 150 men drummers, the chances of her being as good as the best of those male drummers is not yeah. great. You're your band is exactly as bad as your drummer is. Bad drummer, <laughs> bad band. Okay, like, there's no way around. Like bad bassist, you can get away with that. Like <laughs> many, 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 you know, stadium selling bands have bassists that don't really do anything you couldn't learn in six months of practice. The Mark Hoppus. But bad drummer, <laughs> bad drummer, bad band. Well, what am, what are you looking at here? <laughs> what are you looking at that this, is that's this is the not recent, the marble this is not is, marble that is the most recent graduating class in male studies <laughs> this <laughs> probably this is it was just released yesterday on twitter npr <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh my god suddenly i understand why they don't know anything about anything do you, do you suddenly get why uh, Bogosian and... <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's why there they There is not no... nearly enough blue hair. Yeah. That's, like, that can't be real. <laughs> NPR seems to have, like, nothing to draw on as far as, like, culture or experience or history or anything or art. Like, they really have just a few notes they bang on. They're critical theory <laughs> notes. And that's that. Now it makes sense. Jesus, yep. that's incredible yeah so we way to go about diversity we just <laughs> stuck that i stuck that in because it was something they talked about right before they got on to dawkins which they were just kind of making the point brett's been trying to tell dawkins since forever that dawkins in your book the selfish gene you nailed it <laughs> just why don't you see that you nailed it you know it, it's it's the memes, but memes aren't just memes. Like memes are are real deal things that come out of genes, and and the memes of our culture are are all part of us. They're not they're not like a separate accidental thing, and yeah. uh, that's 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 kind of one of the points. So I was trying to make or trying to to show there with that stuff, and then I, I showed the clip from uh, Doug Wilson to kind of show the way he kind of picks apart Dawkins, and I think it's partially just because Dawkins. Dawkins, we were talking about Hitchens when Flip came on, and one of the things about Hitchens that I think is that obviously Hitchens was a smart guy, and he was an evolving guy. He was a guy who would always evolve, and Hitchens would stay up with it. Like 
Hitchens, the same way Dennett kind of evolved what he was thinking about and was looking at and the new ideas coming out of evolutionary psychology and all that sort of stuff, Hitchens, Hitchens would have been up on it and stayed with it. Even if he was still anti-religion, he would have uh, updated his arguments. He was updating them because he himself went out with Doug Wilson. And you can watch some of the clips that he got with Doug Wilson. And he would openly admit to the things that Doug Wilson left him with a thing he didn't have finished or answered in his head yet. And he'd, he'd admit to him. So one of the things that I was just kind of trying to show is that Verveke, and it's kind of long, it was kind of hard to get into it, but one of the things Verveke tries to talk about as an atheist is he tries to, in a, in a Platonic way, with Platonic forms and Neoplatonism, he tries to show that through a non-theist way, he can kind of see the universe with the same abstractions that Christianity does. And he says, well, we should be able to still commune and talk with each other and, and and get along with each other and, and say all that stuff. So one of the things I don't, one of the things I was going to try to clarify and, and get into this is I, I was talking about like, there's different levels of truth. And we were talking about the pragmatic truth versus the empirical truth and which one wins. If you want to see a good debate on that one, watch Pajau argue with um, rationality rules. Pajal and Rationality Rules had a good debate. And one of the things that Rationality Rules did that I really liked was this was a guy who was a, kind of a new atheist type. And then when he first started arguing with people like Peterson and Pajal, he kind of got whipped up a little bit. And then what he went and did is he went and understood the arguments better for like a year, a year or two, and then came back and then held his own. That's kind of just what I'm saying. Like all the uh, Larsons and the, and the Lins and everybody else is like, you kind of got to catch up because you're getting diced up by people who've gone deeper into moral philosophy than you have and, and these evolutionary ideas. And um, so one of the things that about those different levels of truth, one of the things Pajal will talk about is the phenomenology of it. And this is one of the, one of the weird ideas that, because I saw a guy post on the lobster today where he's talking about people can't be trans, but you Christians can think that the wafer can be the body of Christ, you know? And so yeah. you kind of get yeah. to these, these points where you're, you're saying you guys, you guys are all kind of arguing in the world of, of weird abstractions and, and that sorts of stuff. And so why, why does one count and one not count? Well, and well, uh, one of them says it's the thing, literal like, magic. Well, no, but this is what like, like James Lindsay talks about where like this is at its basis a first amendment issue because like there is not a big difference between believing in being trans or believing in transubstantiation, but the Catholics cannot impose pose Catholic doctrine onto every aspect of civilization you know, under American law. It's not allowed. And that's why, like, you know, it's that things like you are welcome to believe that you can be born in the wrong body. You can believe that you're a child of God. You can believe that you lived in the pre-existence and that God sent you to earth. And you can believe in Joseph Smith. You can believe all this stuff, but you got to keep it out of this, like this basic first amendment. It's that simple. And, you know, and that's like, that is entirely how I feel about the whole transgender thing and pronouns and stuff where it's like, you know, like, you know, I feel like using someone's preferred pronouns is like calling someone reverend. No, I'll I know. do it as a I've sign had... of respect to you. But as soon as you say, call me reverend, or you are contributing to the suicides of <laughs> Christians, then no. Well, I always say it like this, because I don't. I don't see it the same as calling someone reverend because I'll call someone reverend because me calling them reverend just is an acknowledgement that their organization gave them that title. That's yeah. fine well, with me. Okay, I maybe a better bishop. example is to but call the way I always brother say or sister it, like in the Mormon context to say well, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. But you know, yeah. No, the way – so the way I always frame it is is like this because when you refer to someone as their preferred pronouns and they don't fit with the biological sex of the person, that's, that's a tacit acknowledgement that – I think that gender is actually some sort of social construct. I think that it's something separate from sex, and I think that it's all changeable. I, I, I yeah. agree. I buy into your ideology. So you're trying it's to tell me... part of the dialectical me, trick they're playing. Yeah, sure. well, you're trying to tell me to pretend... You're trying to force me to pretend to believe something that I don't, or to just, you know, lie. And so the religious tie I always use to that is like, yeah, I think Muslims are incorrect about their worldview, about their view of God. Um, I can... The, the thing is, their definition of respect doesn't entail me every time I talk to them saying that, by the way, Muhammad was a prophet. 
Like it, I don't have to acknowledge, I don't have to pretend that your beliefs are true while I'm talking to you for you to believe that I respect yeah. you. With the trans issue, I have to pretend that your beliefs are true in order for you to feel respected. And nobody else is like that. No other religion is like that. Part of your uh, soteriology is getting me to accept you. you know, that's yeah, part that's of your yeah. salvation. Um, whereas the Mormons, they get <laughs> mad at us. They call us dummies or something like that. Or we don't, we get owned because we don't understand. Or something and like nobody that. else holds themselves hostages <laughs> like that. No, Nobody yeah. else is like, so the, like you're going to get me to kill myself. If, the, well, the Mormons if you don't tell have been me that Muhammad to... is a prophet. And we say it's the same energy, but the Mormons have been trying to get us to call the LDS for a while, and I've never once heard any one of them say they're going to commit suicide because we keep calling them the Mormons. Yeah, they don't hold themselves hostage. And it's Uh, stupid. Every time somebody, every time a Mormon, like, actually tries to correct me, I'm like, no, I'm not. That's stupid. I don't care. When you guys were missionaries, did you suffer any anti-Mormon missionary abuse or violence or or a little bit I mean, drunk guys, i wouldn't call drunk it guys abuse passing by us. but we got we far more got yelled at for being americans than for being mormons yeah. for being american yeah oh that's interesting because like yeah because like i went to northern california and like granted it wasn't a lot it wasn't like you know a daily part of life but people hurling stuff or like insulting joe smith or you know, a few times people threw stuff at us. I, I got, the only I got time rocks it, thrown at us. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. got that. The only time it got serious was like my companion. We were thundering down a rural highway, and somebody from like a moving car going sixty miles an hour hurled a full soda can that hit <laughs> my companion square in the back. Like it was an open can, oh, okay. which I think is like the only reason it didn't cause a serious injury. Because like shit. if it had been a closed can, it would have been like like a rock. Um, but yeah. But, I, you know, I had rocks. I had rocks whiz right past my head several times. Never got huh. hit by one. Maybe it was those garments. Um, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let, let let me throw this stuff out to you because we're talking about like the truth and the levels of truth. To, to do like a Nietzschean critique, anytime you're talking to philosophers or anything, they're always going to try to like angle on what they want a little bit harder and just hold to it a little bit harder. And that's true of Peterson too, as much as anybody in the sense of he, he's not going to give any ground on. On he's going to hold to the new pragmatic truth as truth, and the empiricism thing, no matter what, is always nested inside a pragmatic pragmatic truth. And Pajau always c- tries to go after that too. But let me let me explain it to you this way: the concept of how there's different levels of truth. One real easy concept is: is the Earth round or is the Earth flat? <laughs> there's two levels of truth to that. There's a level of it's round empirically. We know it's round. But phenomenologically, in our lives, we have to treat it like it's flat, because that's what yeah. we're only we're gonna roll off something that's round. Yeah, I just watched. So those, I just watched two somebody, things. I, I just watched a flat earther make the argument that like we know the Earth is flat because like if you look at like the New World Trade Center or any other very tall building, that if the Earth was curved, the top floor should be much wider. <laughs> 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 and this is legitimately his argument and the other because guy's the building like, is no, also no. curved like, do you understand that it's so big that at our scale we can treat it as flat and the curvature is so negligible as to be discardable but <laughs> yeah <if you> so <laughs> so both both of those things but that's that's kind of the point that's the point of the pragmatic truth versus the empirical truth because that the pragmatic person will say the flat one's more true than the empirical one because that's what you got to deal with. Yeah. You know, that's what you got to live with. That's what if you got to work a house, around with. Yeah, if you're building a house, the curvature of the earth bears nothing. You like it, yeah. you can discard it entirely and just get on with your life. So so let me let me do this ranking then. So they say phenomenologically they can make that argument and you can see that there is sort of truth to that. But that same sort of phenomenological thing transgender people try to use and say, phenomenologically, I experienced the world as a female. And so they're they're using the same philosophies. But (laughs) then you can say, well, so I'm talking again about these religions versus a trans argument. 
do they rank the same thing exactly really if we're if we're looking at this or is one of them kind of a little bit more based in a reality and one of them is just completely off the charts yeah you know or not well you know that's that's my well, question no, here's the cl- there, i mean well here i mean we can solve this very quickly we can measure straight lines and curves we can't measure the experience of gender measuring measurable yeah falsifiability but like yeah, yeah like we can we can mathematically describe we can mathematically describe an infinite variety of lines and curves and and they can be built and they're totally consistent we have no empirical model of gender yeah well plus it's entirely I, I that, experiential in order to say that i experience life as a female you would have to you probably have to be perceived as female by everyone around you. <laughs> but I'd, I'd say that's yes. And then also what's going on inside your body would have to be, <laughs> you would have had to have ovaries in you from the second you're born. Sure. Yeah. How yeah, does yeah. that, that's how the, does that I mean, not, that's the, how does that not act on you? You know what I that's, mean? How does that not, that's the biological <laughs> aspect of it, the social aspect of it. Matt, um, Matt Walsh, I think Matt Walsh killed this one. Oh, yeah. Because like I can no more experience the world as a woman than I can experience the world as a cat. I said, yeah, and it's it's really I mean it's almost the same argument but, that the but, critical but race me, theorists make. You cannot know what it's like to be a black person because you haven't had the experiences but, your whole entire life. But then there's because the other thing is to say like, well, okay, so then to say that well I do I do experience the world as a man, okay. But how much does that really tell me about the lives of other men? <laughs> well, it tells you everything. We all have the same level of <laughs> privilege. <laughs> and we, I, <laughs> I, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, again, like, because I remember a million years ago, John Larson talking about, like, the, talking about the Mormon conception of resurrection and the afterlife. And he's like, what do you need lungs for? You just go two questions deep and the thing falls apart. This stuff is one question deep. It's one question deep and it falls apart. Yeah. Well, so, um, I guess that does that really even fall apart? Like the two lungs thing? Like, like well, no, I mean, I think a well, Mormon like, would just say, I don't know how it works. Well, I know. I mean, because I get John Larson's point because the whole, because they make this whole big thing about we, we need our bodies. Like, that's why Mormon's like, it's not prohibited. Oh, no, no cremation. There's no rule against cremation. Okay. But, you know, our bodies, our bodies, our bodies. And, like, and that we will be resurrected as we are, but perfected, whatever that means. Does So that's the thing is, like, if so I am even as, a Mormon, as I am, do I have a digestive tract? And if I have a digestive tract as a resurrected being, do I use it? Do I shit? And so, like, do I have lungs? And if I have lungs, do I need them to breathe oxygen? What happens if I don't? See, even you know? as a Mormon, like... That I like, I push back against that. Because okay. I remember, like, people are like, what are you going to do with your body when you die? I'd be like, I'm going to be cremated. They're like, why? Because it's, it's probably cheaper than finding a burial yeah. plot. I don't know. I don't care what happens in my body. Yeah. They're like, my but what about the I resurrection? Think... And I'm like, well, like, God will resurrect me still, right? And he's like, well, yeah, but, like... Like, you should keep your body intact. I was like, I, my, I can't yeah. keep my body intact. Like, it's so, going to decay. Just... Plus, do you think that's really going to be a problem for God? Do you think for God, the all-powerful, omnipotent God, that it's more difficult for him to create a body, like, to resurrect a recently dead corpse than it is to make a pile of ashes into a full, alive human being yeah. perfected? No, it's not. That makes no difference to him. And my whole thing, though, because like even as a Mormon, I had this problem where I thought, like, what's more selfish than saying, hey, everybody, <laughs> this plot of ground, this is where my rotting corpse is. And as, as, oh, for, as long as this civilization exists, this is mine. <laughs> Stay the fuck off. <laughs> so that is weird. Okay. So <laughs> that's the thing is like if, if somebody said, Hey, we want to build an apartment complex on your grandma, I'd be like, No. <laughs> but like for me, like, no, just go ahead and burn my corpse. Like, yeah. like yeah. I'm fine with it. <laughs> but don't pay yeah. over grandma. So Although they found King Richard the Fifth in a car park. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. 
I was just I was just learning about Edmund Burke, and he had to be buried in an unmarked grave because the Jacobins from the French Revolution wanted to desecrate his corpse. That's neither here nor there. But <laughs> um, so from the start of this whole thing, where I really wanted to give titty twisters to uh, uh, Lars and Dolin, even RFM to an extent, is that you guys can't do the postmodern thing and we're the hard empirical guys at the same time. You know, you yeah. got to pick. And, and um, so kind of going through to that, one of the original arguments when people started figuring out this postmodern stuff is, is a lot of people turned to Stephen Hicks. I brought, I brought this up before, but Stephen Hicks had the book describing postmodernism. And then you got a lot of these philosophical highbrow people who are like, no, 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 who get real pedantic. I, I think so much philosophy is so much easier if we could just oversimplify it and just say it like it is and stop with all this. Like you, you watch any philosophy channel on YouTube and first off, it's almost like you, you get these TAs from, from college because they're always like these foreigners with these weird accents and, and speaking <laughs> about it almost like too, with too much solemnity of the thing. Well, like, did Nietzsche think of it like this? You know, and you're I like, wish I could remember up. where it was, but somewhere somewhere in one of the many James Lindsay lectures and it's one that I've listened to more than once I should find it. but he says something like I don't even remember what he's talking about he says something at one point where he says something about like you know like and if I'm saying that wrong the point of language is to convey an idea not to satisfy some what philosophers consider important in their little game you know because that's a thing that like you know because I spent like I don't know a solid decade steeped in that whole new atheism slash evangelical, you know, like William Lane Craig versus Dawkins thing, you mm. know, and um, <laughs> kind of lost my train of thought there. But like the the pedant the pedantry of the pedantry of the terminology and the the little philosophy. Yeah, no, but oh no, yeah, that, exactly. Like with the philosophy, like because especially with William Lane Craig, where it's like I see how you're winning this philosophical like literal like university classroom philosophy class game but that's not how real people talk and that's and just because you've satisfied the ph philosophy course doesn't mean that what you said is real or true or anything you know like you really are just doing this like it's it's a lot like marx it's, it's an intellectual swindle you know, like I, that's what I kind of feel like William Lane Craig does with this whole Kalam argument. Well, but I think but, that's what the point is, is why it's going to get at. So going almost all the way back, Nietzsche, <laughs> I, I was I was looking at Nietzsche and Nietzsche, he has this book called The Twilight of the Gods. And the, the point of that book is to rip apart the original philosophers. You know, it's to it's to rip apart Plato and Socrates and um, even even Kant and Schopenhauer. And what he's ripping apart about all of them is they're abstracting, you know, just the simple concept that we're doing and we're saying, we're talking about all the, the Neoplatonism of Verveke and all the stuff that I was showing the other day. It's like, just like cut out all your abstracting to, to try to make the world fit the thing that you want it to fit. And um, uh, he said that he liked the guys better before Plato and Socrates. And if you think about it, his complaint about Socrates is that he called Socrates Caraborel. Why is Socrates Caraborel? Socrates was just Plato putting up TikTok videos of him arguing with himself about something that supposedly happened and he gets the better of the other person. And look, I'm always winning these arguments because I'm talking these people out of these things and that sort of stuff. Like Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's complaint about Socrates is basically our complaint about uh, Caraborel. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> that he was is just a bunch of straw mans of, of him you're welcome Sarah Burrell. the nicest thing he ever said about you on this channel is that you're compared to socrates now <laughs> yeah he's winning all these fights and so then his complaints was that plato made these abstractions about forms and all that stuff because he wanted to make this world this ideal idealism and then the idealism of hegel that came down to the idealism of marx and his complaint about the stoics was this idealism and what is his complaint about all that idealism is that you want to alter the human to fit your thing rather than take the human as the human is, you know, you, you, you're trying to abstract these things. So, so people hated Hicks's book because Hicks pointed to Kant as the original postmodernist and people say, well, how could Kant be the original postmodernist? He's a, he's an enlightenment guy. He's from the top of, you know, human Kant and all those guys. And, but 
mainly Kant. And the reason is because Hicks is right. Kant was trying to make room to maintain his religious perspective. And to maintain his religious perspective, he came up with this concept of the noumenon, which is your, your five senses. You can only really trust them like in a matrix sort of way. He really did kind of come up with the concept of the matrix in the first place. Like, like we don't really see what's out there in front of us. We only see what our perceptions are. And we're kind of stuck inside of this uh, virtual headset video game of our lives. And so we can't really know what the truth is out there at all. We can only really kind of feel around and halfway touch it and, and all that sorts of stuff. And going from Kant, I mean, I'd say Hegel even did a little bit, but going down to the phenomenologists, as I said, I mean, Husserl and those guys, like I said, the, the Mormon apologists have started getting into these guys because they do teach you how you can, you know how like if some math problem that you can't solve, the way you can almost get to solve it is you start tacking on layers on top of it. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's almost kind of the same thing. It's like we start abstracting, we start, we start pulling out, we start making things like we're, we're inside of this video game and suddenly anything can become real. Constructs, constructs and constructs and constructs. And Nietzsche from the start said, the second all these guys started talking, all the talking was when the bullshit started. <laughs> you know? He just he, pull, he throws it all back to Socrates and Plato. He just says, all this talky, 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 talking is when all this lying just came about. And, and it's all just been that ever since. And that's not to say that none of them were ever right about any of this sort of stuff, but this is where you get the problem with Nietzsche, because Nietzsche respected Machiavelli, or he respected the, the, the sophist. He respected the sophist more than he respected Socrates, because he said it is just about power. He respected that the, Ath the, the Athenians went to their surrounding islands and said, hey, we're taking you over. Why? Because we're the strong ones. But why we don't give whys we're the strong ones <laughs> shut up was, and was um nietzsche, is, is nietzsche philosophy scarface <laughs> yeah but it's, it's ultimately pretty much that stuff but this is this is kind of one of my points is that i, I sent you that thing i sent earlier i said it to, to troy who's marking our thing is that i still land on the side of these guys who are abstracting who who are coming up with these ways to kind of make a point of there being politeness and honor or deontology being true all you know is is above winning um i still side with those guys even though they the whole thing's just been abstracting 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 out the ass but you can take the point that that then has its limits too because they can start abstracting out into super wonky weird things and, and all that sort of stuff but as long as we're in a world where we're talking, we're able to debate and try to fill out what the axioms are for ourselves. Whereas Nietzsche will say he more respects the Machiavellian who just says, just win, just win. And it, we were talking, the reason I'm talking about that is right before this, we were talking about being so irritated at just seeing that to the side that started breaking that side of sort of things down, the postmodernist side or whatever, they do not care if they contradict themselves they just do not um right right before we came on here you, jared you were saying that it was um you think that it's because uh they're short memoried or like why Very don't why don't you're talking about the short-sighted short memory yeah filibuster stuff and <laughs> and well, um, i mean it's been a, I don't know, however long it's been i'm acquainted with like a local city councilman he's not my city councilman he's like the neighboring district but he's somebody that I've known since before he was a city <laughs> councilman. We're not friends, but he's just an acquaintance, whatever. And when Amy Kerr, Comey Barrett's, whatever, the last uh, nomin uh, Supreme Court nominations nominee came up, there was the whole, it's an election year. We must delay this at all costs, right? And this local... Like they tried to do with Obama? <laughs> exactly. This, <clears throat> this guy who is, he's a lefty. Like you can his web page. He's I'm for progressive stuff. I'm an LGBTQ rights lawyer. All this stuff. He's very right down the line Democrat, and he writes this thing about how important it is, you know, to delay this uh, nomination. You know, even though the the rules be damned. So on this post, like I just like, and I it took me a while to do it, but I remembered it because I have that kind of memory, and I scrolled back in time. So when the roles were reversed and it was the Republicans who were delaying the nomination and I just took a screenshot of his post, which is <laughs> boo, do your job. And I just posted with that. Nothing else. Just, this is what you said 
the last time this happened, but the parties were reversed. And we got into a brief argument where he this basically said, this time, is, this time is different, and besides, Republicans are jerks. Like, that's literally <laughs> really what it was. Like, well, this is different because Republicans are jerks. That's, I'm not, I don't think I'm being terribly unfair by summarizing his, his argument as such. <laughs> but I'm like, no, this is just naked hypocrisy. And his, and then his husband insulted me and and accused me of whatever, you know, the usual alt-right shit. But like, and I'm just like, okay. And I'm just like, wow, like, it is that simple, you know? Because I'm, because, you know, I said, like, you either believe in the process or you don't. You know, and it's clear that you don't. You can't have made it clear that this is all about political contingency for you. It, and it's, it's nothing to do. They're they're with, Machiavellians. They're political Machiavellians. They don't they don't care if yeah. they have to be consistent. It's like the Athens. Well, no, and, and the, they the don't. Athenians said they don't care to really hide talking. it, and they don't care to hide that they're inconsistent. Like yeah. it, like that's that's what the thing that's so striking to me. I mean, I was just talking we to my dad. Don't like my have dad earlier today is like. Why do these people get away with lying? It's that, because and I, I told them. you that term before the cesareanism, which is the, the the concept. I think that comes out of Oswald Spangler, who just says you get to this level of Caesar where you have so much power, you no longer have to lie about it. And it's kind of that same thing that Nietzsche pointed to with the Athenians of saying, we have so much power and we're just doing this because we got the power. And we've actually even told you in all of our theorizing that we don't care about all this stuff. We're you know, we'll we'll scream at you if you try to do the power game because we're the ones playing that power game. So stop it. Um, we don't care if we're consistent. We don't care if we're principled. We don't care if we're correct or right or based in reality. And so my kind of point, and I, I point back to that video. Maybe I'll clip it in here. We watched it before already, where James Lindsay and uh, that other guy from the atheist. Um, rational what was he called like the libertarian atheist or something like that they were saying all right this whole philosophical side of people who do the abstractions the neoplatonists through the christians through the kantians through all that stuff and hard empiricists the logical the logical positivists all you people who still are basing yourselves in maybe there's some sort of objectivity to this world we got to get past the, <laughs> these little petty fights we really do like like sure you guys can abstract and your abstract i'll grant you that your abstractions are hitting at some reality actually and uh the hard empiricists are gonna say well we're just going to try to be autistically empir empirical about all this stuff even though we'll accidentally abstract ourselves sometimes because we're human um we let's all get past this because that other side's machiavellian they they take on the full nietzschean thing they don't converse there's no conversation nietzsche says i don't like all the talky 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 i don't like just just take the power do the power stop all this abstracting stop all this thinking stop all this asking what you think what you think what you think let's uh you know and that's kind of yeah, one of the know, things that, that uh, doug I, wilson was pointing out he was kind of snickering at, at dawkins for saying well, the morality comes, do, do me your doc as a personation. The morality comes from, from dinner parties and people talking at dinner parties mm. or something like that. Um, yeah, but well, it's, it's basically, I mean, it's, it sounds to me like an affirmation of the Hada Jait position of like, no, stop fucking around, stop negotiating, fight. Yeah. And the winner, that's how we know who's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah it, it really, really is. is power. It's will to power stuff. It ultimately is will to power stuff, the postmodern stuff. And the Machiavellian stuff, I say Machiavellian because the Machiavellians are the ones who will use wokeness when you know they're not woke. That's what the Machiavellians are. The, yeah. They're full dark triad types. But then you actually have woke people who are true believers in wokeness, true postmodernists. But they all land on that, what Nietzsche is saying. Like, let's stop talking. No talking. We're not, we're not arguing this anymore. We're not, you're not allowed to argue this. I think Jonathan just shared with us some lady who was saying she's done arguing with it and just wanted her, her uncle's podcast pulled down. We're not, we're not I didn't here to talk. That, yeah. yeah, I didn't read Here's it all. Your, I, haven't, I haven't read the AP article either, so I don't. Well, that, um, that's a whole different subject, but. I, I didn't mean, know what that was about. No, it's, so it's but like. You don't know the possible? AP article? No, uh, it's, the, it's about the, 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 the most Mormon recent church one about the... covering up. Some yeah, but I couldn't tie it all together to what Jonathan that that post by that person and what Jonathan like I don't know. That was just a lady who was getting her uncle canceled, so she just appealed to the podcast places to to have him removed and have him not be able to talk. Wow. And, so it's kind of like, like I scanned through it. It was very long. I scanned through it and I'm like, wait, what's going on here? 
and I couldn't put it all together. So it, it's um, just a, it's just another case of censorship that you can't say the stuff that we don't like. So to to tie this all back in, Quick made an episode just earlier today, and he was talking about free speech, and he brought up the whole point of people who are on top never seem to be that into the free speech and the people who are on the bottom get get back into free speech as flip was just noticing earlier he was talking about how both sides of them will get inconsistent on, on that especially once they get in the lead on something yeah. people who are losing and this is a nietzschean point that's part of nietzschean slave morality losers always want to talk the, the underdogs always want to talk it out and the top guys just want just want to be the uh the top of the, the pack anyway and shut up and um, you can usually tell who's the, the hegemon at any point by who's trying to <laughs> block more speech and who's the, uh, but Nietzsche was, Nietzsche in his way hated the underdogs. You know, he, the people saying, hey, <laughs> let's have speech. I think maybe one way I am, maybe it's because I was raised a, a Utah jazz fan or something. I can't help but always be an underdog. So, because <laughs> as soon as, as soon as the other side takes the power and starts censoring, I'll probably jump to the other side or something. See, I, but, I fight against my, my underdog rooting. And it's because I was raised by my mom, who has what I like to call <laughs> the underdog syndrome. I call it that because she had six kids and I was the oldest of those kids. Mm. so they were all up, right and correct yeah no it, when she was growing up <coughs> she was the youngest and her brothers were assholes to her and so she it was kind of like a might makes right in her household so she didn't want to <laughs> have that in her kids household so it was the underdog syndrome where the underdog is always right if there was a dispute and she couldn't figure out who was who was in the right it was always the younger one so and I'm the fucking oldest. So anytime my uh, siblings, anytime they did anything at all, yeah, it'd be I'm like, gonna, they could so say she, she, she was handicapping all of your siblings. Yeah, they'd say like, oh, douchebag or something like that. And and I'd hear them say so, that from downstairs and I'd hear her go, Jared. And I <laughs> go upstairs like, what? So okay, so where did but, he learn this word? It's like he rides the public school bus. You know what they say there? I can't block noises out from his ears, mom. So I think, I think, I mean, I experienced life as a middle child and I got to get it from both ends. I was like the ultimate shrinking middle class, man. Like the, the elite <laughs> got everything, but the underdog got all the, uh, and yeah. just forget about me. I, I was always wrong no matter what. But uh, the. Uh, that was th third out of four. That was, yeah. Yeah. So I was middle, so, like Nephi. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? Oh gosh, what were we just talking about? Oh, the uh, AP article. Uh, you guys didn't read any of that. I I read most of it. Like, cause it was one of those things where it's like, isn't this like the same article from five years ago? I thought it but, was too when somebody brought it up to me. But well, I mean, it's also it's kind of like this article about. I mean, because it like church sex scandal. Because we know about, like, Mormon sex scandal. We know about Catholic sex scandal. Did you know about Australia and Jehovah's Witnesses? That's a whole... They did a whole public inquisition that you can go read. And I've read it. Like, hmm. and, like, and you can go down forever of, like, pick a place, pick a religion, pick a sex scandal. Like, <laughs> it's all there. <laughs> sex scandal. Yeah. Like, no, it, it really is. I mean... Like so I, I just showed this joke to my dad, but the South Park episode NSA, where like they make the joke because like you know the whole joke is that Butters, you know, because Cartman's worried about the NSA and government spying, and he's you know talking about like don't you know the government's watching us? They see everything we do. So Butters goes home and prays to Obama and says, please keep, us, <laughs> please keep me and my family safe. And he goes to the DMV, you know, to confess his sins. You know, it's a whole South Parkian thing. And the DMV becomes the religion. And then the DMV <laughs> collapses under a sex scandal. And so, every, so, and, and, so and, and so, like, you know, the news reporter's like, well, because of this, everybody's encouraged to go confess your sins at the post office. Wait, the post office has been shut down over a sex scandal. And the, the only people can trust is the media. And we'll be back. Oh, wait, sex scandal. And, like, because they're... But it's like that's so, that, that, that Chris talks about is that, like, because everybody thinks... You know, like, this is a game that I've noticed having gone down the rabbit hole of pick a place, pick a sex scandal, is because people always want to point at the thing and say, and, and the sex scandal goes like, aha, see, look at your organization and your sex scandal. It must be about your fundamental 
ideas and where it's like no like it's a any, any organization certainty. with yeah yeah any yeah. organization with with uh that's yeah. properly built would have zero yeah. sex scandals so uh, yeah uh, the yeah, like, made no, the like, claim you, you get enough people like it, the larger your organization gets like you get to the point where sex scandals become a mathematical certainty. <laughs> like, yeah, they, they so become unavoidable. Dillon made the claim in that thing that he said. Of course, they always make these things that sends me off to the races of verifying. Like that's not true, but he he tried to make the claim <laughs> that it was nine percent of the the Catholic fathers had had to uh, get caught abusing and, and molesting kids. And no, yeah. that's, that's nowhere near well, that's true. That's a lot. Yeah. No, and the other thing is, like, this is one of those things where, like, I mean, it was many years into the whole cat. I mean, it's fairly recently. It was only within the last couple of years. I think it was you that sent me a link that was just like, you know, somebody did some honest statistical journalist guy was like, guys, it's public education. Like, yeah. if, if so, you're worried about who, if you want to know who is sexually <laughs> molesting the kids, it is the public educators they are the walmart of, of kitty diddlers <laughs> by like, far they are the, by far they are and the that's machine. when that's when surveying children you know the surveying children yeah. it, it's something like seven to nine percent most of them said that that it was a school teacher or a gym teacher or a coach that, yeah. that had molested them in most cases like, and, on the sale uh, thing like yeah like catholicism and mormonism is ma and pa kitty diddling and yeah Public and education is the is state level kitty kitty difference. It's going to be the same thing with the <laughs> with, <laughs> with the scouting program, which they got that thing where they you know the church pays money into it, so that must mean that they're guilty for it. Although there's there's definitely some sort of side of that. It doesn't like say anything about the level of actual claims that that should like drop on the church's head. But of course, the Lynn's entire week of nine hours of stuff which i watched too much of it but not all of it but a lot is him of course making sure everything is 100 percent that church's fault but i mean it's hitting hard on some uh true believers i saw brad from the uh the midnight mormons was really upset at it alejandro from the lobsters was really upset at it all these guys and part of what it is is i think every single one of them is more upset at those individual bishops not even at the church just like those individual yeah. bishops like Call the dumb cops bishop. Like, don't even yeah. ask your, don't even ask the church well, or anything like that. Well, because I was just thinking about, like, continuing on about this thing about the scale of the thing. Because we're like, you know, as your organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's inevitable you get a sex scandal. Meanwhile, because it just dawned on me, like, Open Stories had like six people. <laughs> <laughs> when they had their sex <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could man. fit them all in a in a small upscale restaurant nicely. <laughs> yeah. They they managed to have a, a, a nearly well, you know. That's one of the things I notice he talks about too, is he talks about how they use certain different legal legal justifications to get out of certain things. And and I didn't want to point out that one of the ways that you can get out of an EEOC claim, which even had RFM backing on that. But one of the ways you get out of an EEOC claims, you say, I don't have 15 employees. And yeah, the that's EEOC right. yeah, that's the only, will only review companies that are 15 employees and more. And But then you say, hey, look, it's an exoneration because they threw out the case. And, but I wouldn't even bring that up except for the Lynn would try to point out several cases where the church was trying to get out of stuff on technicalities. <laughs> but the thing that I think really irritates me the most about him is if he was just podcaster, if like even if it was just RFM doing this or Larson freaking out about this, I wouldn't be so irritated, irritated about this. But this is a dude who went to go get his PhD in psychology and therapy to show the world that he's real deal credentialed. I got to credentials guy. If you watch the nine hours, take, take my word for it. Don't take my word for it, but maybe save yourself nine hours for it. You could probably take my word for it. His whole thing is trying to get everybody who's with him to get outraged. Like, get more outraged. Get more upset about this. Like, what about you, Gerardo? Like, they think about this. They excommunicated you, and they probably didn't even excommunicate these kitty diddlers. Does that piss you off? Yeah. <laughs> That's if it were my favorite things, I, I want to get like a bunch of cut cutaways to where it goes over to Gerardo after the Lynn 
thinks that he's successfully asked a leading question, but he's not very good at it. So mm. Gerardo doesn't know what the fuck to say to help him out. There's so okay. many, and I think that's true of what happened in that moment, because I think that exact moment happened. I think what you're saying is you could take the cutaway because Gerardo didn't take the bait, like, in the way that John would like him to, because there but was... But he's not like moment. he's his friend and he wants to help him out, but he's like, I don't know what you want me to say yeah. right now. Yeah. I don't know how you're trying to tokenize me right now. But like I well, said, in those like, other like moments... Maybe, maybe Gerardo isn't filled with anger and rage. Maybe he <laughs> yeah. disagrees with the church. Yeah. And so we were talking about... I was mentioning that, that Jen starts crying and then like he stops the presses and puts the camera on her for, for any time she's crying and stuff like that. But it it wouldn't irritate me if it were John Larson or whatever, but this is a guy who like goes spouting the PhD credentialism and that's what his whole show is about and all that stuff. And if there's anything that therapists and psychologists are not supposed to be doing, it's exactly what he's doing. He's like, feel the rage, catastrophize. It's the thing Jonathan Haidt talks about catastrophize it's the opposite of cognitive behavioral therapy it's like everybody stop and catastrophize this right now i feel like you i feel like half of therapy is trying to get the client stop catastrophizing (laughs) or ideally no i was just thinking about this i mean i was talking to co-workers about this because recently they them are gone now but we had a they them part-timer that worked for a few weeks with us and like and i i'm almost sad like like i was disappointed because like they were such a stereotypical they them. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into any kind of details, but like I was just talking to my coworkers about like like ideally it used to be that like therapist was somebody you went to for help. So like you would go to the therapist and say, therapist, I feel a lot of anxiety at work. I feel anxiety about dealing with people, and I feel anxiety about this and and all that. And the therapist like because it used to be like I understood my like in my ideal version of it the therapist says well here are some ways like let's let's talk about ways we can learn to cope with this let's learn how to deal with this let's learn how to think about this and let's learn how you can experience these things without it shutting you down no that doesn't happen what happens when you go to therapy now is the therapist says oh here is a letter take it to your hr department and now your employer is legally obligated to put up with your Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, it's the the idea that either you can change or the world can change, and they used to try to help you to change because that's all you can do is change yourself. Now they now they try to convince you that you can change the world around you. The world makes yeah. you anxious. Well, then the whole world has to stop doing what they're doing that makes you anxious, and then you get all of these conflicting different anxiety triggers that it, eventually we can do nothing. No, and well, like this is the thing that's worse about this is because like this person worked here many years ago before I worked there. And the guy manager now had trepidations because they were a problem before. And this guy like said, like, cause, I mean, it was always going to be a temporary summer thing. Like, you know, they're in grad school, that kind of thing. And like, because I heard this right after, it's like, so like, you'll be able to do this part of the job. Because last time that was a problem. And you'll be able to do this part of the job. And that was, a, and they said, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> well, God damn it. Like, why'd you do that? You know? But Yeah, so the, there's the, the second level of stuff that I think the Lynn really pushes at. Because this is, this is, again, where I imagine like a week happens like this. And Delin turns into what's her name from Ghost Ghostbusters? You know, we got one. Hello, Ghostbusters. Yes, of course they're serious. You do. You have. No kidding. Uh huh. Well, just uh, just give me the address. Uh-huh. Yes, of course. Oh, they'll be totally discreet. Thank you. We got one! The call! The whole week is then spent of him just making hay out of it. People, to, to give some credit to some Democrats, I see some of them point to stuff like when these Democrats say that Trump stole nuclear weapons, he's going to start a bomb, he's whatever bullcrap they're saying, and they get text messages from the Democrat representatives and saying, the world is ending and Trump's going to kill us all. And this is the, we're, there's nothing we can do. And the alt-right's going to get us. But if you send me $20, 
I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. And and I, I saw some left wingers like like ridiculing that and and credit to them for for seeing through stuff like that. But there's there's a level of Delin doing that to me. Like the jurors have been crap and they're totally crap and we need to get them to change their crap and they're so terrible. And oh my gosh, are you crying, Jen? Are you crying, Jen? But if you send me twenty dollars <laughs> right now, I mean, <laughs> but, but uh, your donations are super helpful. <laughs> But uh, the second level of it is that they're always pushing, why doesn't the church just see that technocratic control is the answer? Why doesn't the church just see that they just gave it over to these politicians and these uh, government things, that it'll just be handled just super duper well? Those, those guys, there's no, there's no kitty diddling in anything governmental at all. As soon as you admit there is no God, Joseph Smith was a, a, a rapist, a fraud, and a liar, and there's, you know, like, like, as soon, yeah, just that, like, just give up everything you believe, and then we'll be okay. Like, that's John <laughs> DeLynn's bargain. Speaking you know, of, like, <laughs> speaking why are you of mad John at me? Dillon. I'm just telling you yeah. that everything would be great if you gave up all like, of your beliefs. I just, I just realized <laughs> that, like, really, like, John DeLynn's argument and ISIS's argument are pretty much the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, acquiesce and everything will be fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of and, Jonathan, and, I don't know if this came out, but uh, well, I didn't see this the, in the thing Jonathan sent us, but that Dinah Kimball thing tagged him a couple days ago in a thing saying, John DeLynn has removed the episodes from his platform. I'm officially asking anyone who has episodes of my uncle Tom Kimball on their podcast to remove these episodes and take them down. Full stop. Pass it on. I oh, I want to. I don't. I, what is that, 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 what is that one about? Like, I don't even know. I don't know. It's her last name's Kimball. I don't know if it's. I I'm, well, I thought like, Tom Kimball was a brother of or, or a, a nephew of um. Like of what? Spencer. What did he say? If I was a personal friend of Dana is, Kimball. I would send her a link to the Wikipedia article on the Streisand effect. Yeah. Like, like what? whatever it is you want me to not to look at, now I want to see it. Wait, she I said, no idea she's censoring it from a, it. she's censoring it from like a woke angle, isn't she? That's what I. See, well, that's, I don't even know. I don't even know. I don't get That's it. how I interpreted it. So I might've said stuff wrong if it, if it wasn't, but that, I mean, maybe I didn't read it close enough. Um, but like, oh, Jesus. No, it says she's a latter day survivor. Like, so. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that he did one of his podcasts where where wild claims were allowed to be made, even though he doesn't like if wild claims are made about him. But he's fine <laughs> bringing on other people to make wild claims about other people without anybody there to defend themselves or back themselves up about the claims. I'm guessing that at some point one of those, because there's been multiple of those, he had uh, Tom uh, Kimball. He okay. probably had to take yeah, it somebody down. somebody said, "Isn't he an abuser? Why is he on a podcast?" And she said. Yes, he was my abuser, but several places still have his episodes public and are published. And she said, Wow, that's fucked up. Like, I don't So were the episodes just random episodes or were they about abuse? No, I'm pretty like... sure Tom Kimball, and I, I might have listened to these ones when I first left the church. I'm pretty sure he is like a nephew or something to Spencer W. Kimball. And he just gives sort of inside information. On Spencer W. Kimball. Was he that guy who did that whole podcast? I'm not a podcast. He had like a vlog. No, no you that think was more Benson. Curtin, that Benson. was Taft. Yeah. yeah, Benson's grandson. Yeah, I, I guess I didn't know exactly what that thing was. I just knew that she, I thought she was like saying censor and shut the guy down and shut everything down. But I mean, this the answer to everything's censored. So I mean, the point still stands on that. But the Delin stuff, I see going on, like, just, just to say from the start, this this stupid AP story sucks. It does suck. It's like, what are you doing, church, a little bit? And I, and I see that enough from other church members or believers saying, this does suck. Like, why why don't you just report the freaking guy? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. So is it like a church policy <laughs> to not report the guy? Is that what's happening? No, because, I mean, I, no. my dad, 20 years ago, I know my dad would have reported the dude. I don't know what's going on. The, the big... Um, the big scandal as far as like when you get down to the nigger-ritty and which also like is the exact same scandal the Jehovah's Witnesses have had and everybody has had basically is that like the church breaks it down jurisdictionally and yeah. there are some so states Arizona is more like you have to report and some states you don't and that's the thing is like 
the bishops are instructed. Like if the bishop follows the instructions, they read the manual. If somebody comes and says that I've been molesting my children, you call this number. You call that number. It's a lawyer at Curtin McConkie. That Curtin, that lawyer says, you know, where are you? Where are mm -hmm. you? And who said what? And depending on local laws, he either says, K, hang up and call the police or do not call the police. Keep so talking to me. There was some breaking down of example. that and them trying but again, to do that's not the that. Mormon. That's not just the Mormon church. That's every large organization in any state with a law department has there that are, policy. There are some places and they did get sued by some place for yeah, like, a guy getting turned in by his bishop for, for some sort of thing. But he's getting sued by a guy who was in prison at the time who was suing them because the mm -hmm. guy had been guilty of the thing. And so Jalen, Dylan and those guys shrugged that off of like, well, so what if that guy does that or some sort of thing like that, which I think might be true. Sure. True. Whatever. Like to be a deontologist, do the right thing. And, and there's some level where I say, bringing the technocrats in. I don't like people saying the Mormon church has to bring in technocrats to be the ones who do all the interviews for them or something like that for the little kid. But yeah. um, there's some level of assault happen, call a cop. Like, I don't think that's too technocratic oversight. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. rape happen, call a cop. Yeah. But the other situation is they say, we don't know the level of detail the bishop actually knew or not. Because the whole final details of it were really horrendous. But we don't know if the bishop knew that along. And then there's a second yeah. thing where they said the bishop was begging the wife to turn him in and to call the cops. But then there's another issue where they say, well, it's still your fault because she's probably on the spectrum somewhere. She's some sort of autistic or something. Oh, that's just that then. Okay. So it just uh, stems all back to the church. <laughs> she's the church autistic is the worst. and therefore incapable of doing the right thing. No. I... <laughs> so the it all just Charlie stems Madison back to the church is the worst and the church is the terrible and all that stuff. Yeah. And it's, it's true. It's like, you guys could have gotten that one just better. You should have done that. But at the same yeah. time, you guys weren't the rapers or whatever. But um, John DeLynn is going to catastrophize it and try to make it sound like the honest word. And then he keeps saying this thing of like, I've got literally thousands, thousands of abuse survivors who've contacted me, thousands of them, thousands and thousands. And uh, here's a question like, I mean, because we don't have a huge audience and we've never done this before, but I'm genuinely curious because so comment below. But who would you rather, like, let's say you had a teenage child that had questions about sex and sexuality. Would you feel safer if they went to talk to their local bishop or John DeLynn? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, their gym teacher or something like that. No, Cause, but, like, cause... I'm seriously thinking about this because, like, I mean, because it's a tough one because, like, you know, bishop is a random person, but, like, my experience is that, like, most of the bishops I knew or had... Or bishops are less than random. Yeah, they're generally yeah, going to be like pretty they're, good guys. They're, they're, yeah, there's, there is a select, there's a selection going on there. But, like, yeah, like, seriously, like, who would you rather give your teenage child sex, sex advice about sex and sexuality, a bishop or chocolate? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna show you guys... I'm going to show you guys some videotape of what it was like John Lynn talking to people after he'd riled them up. Go ahead for a second. It's a ten second. That's John DeLynn would be a terrible one to do that to because he's <laughs> fucking weird with that stuff. Like, I mean, there's all the. I listened to that whole tape where the rosebud lady is is talking about her things yeah. with him, and there's the, like the forensic interview tape. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the parts I don't know about the rest of it, but one of the parts sounded so believable to me because she kept. She's like, oh, he kept asking me about the porn that I watch or something. He kept trying to bring up sex and stuff like that. And it reminded me, he's got this really cringy TikTok that he did with Kara where, like, he thought it was the funniest thing ever. He just goes, I bet you watch porn. And she goes, no, you watch porn. And he's like, no, you watch porn. So and then that's the that whole TikTok. That like one that, set off new oh, name Noah. That is, that's one of the oh. ones that set off new name Noah really hard on him. But I was like, that's fucking weird, man. Because there's no punchline. Nobody could mistake this for a joke. No, that and you're trying exactly to pass it off as a joke. Actual porn dialogue like 
Like, it was reassurance that even me, good old John Lynn, watches porn. Well, Ready? we did find out that his his wife is sexually non-conforming. Oh, Christ. <laughs> oh, yay! I watched the new Pussies today. Yay! Welcome to Pussies, the podcast about women for women <laughs> by men who support <laughs> and honor uh, and cherish cherish respect <laughs> and the temperature of women <laughs> um, michael and i are not going to be doing our usual fun lecture for you all um roe v wade has been struck down it's been 17 days and we are just bloated with rage michael aren't we and uh, um michael uh well I, we wanted to do this the day of roe v wade and you we lost michael he was he Ran, ran away for lack of a better term and he he couldn't even i think is what uh, <laughs> situation. Uh, are we keeping it together now michael and, this thing uh, is 30 uh, minutes long and i think kurt mesker halfway breaks once yes i don't know she's how he doesn't break more producer. there's she's stuff at the end where they're talking about the the soul control Oh my gosh! Who are jealous of I've never seen this. A dwarf woman of color. Have you never seen the pussies? No, this is a, this is why don't, you listen, why don't you listen to the wisdom of this dwarf? They talk about like the dwarf. It's the first time dwarf women are getting represented, and they notice like, wait a minute, there's dwarf black women in the world. Why didn't they? Why didn't they hire one? <laughs> about princess he said the fact that you are the first black woman to be a dwarf in tolkien the first woman to be a dwarf in tolkien but what do we learn about woman dwarves that we didn't know through your portrayal well we learned that they exist <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse michael she seemed of um typical height oh she seemed of typical as. height uh, did you find that? <laughs> Unless they were all... Michael, I, I don't want to use a word like gobsmacked, but I, I'm i fairly certain that she is of, uh, of a typical height. I, I <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I know it's upsetting. You're four foot two today. Then maybe this um, interviewer is a, a child, a four or five year old. Are the other people are dwarves standing behind? She let's take a little another look because, yeah, I believe the people be. I listened to this part, I wasn't quite, watching. Smushed, quite large. She seemed quite large. Well, what do we learn about woman dwarves that we didn't know through your portrayal? Well, we learned that they exist. <laughs> yeah, she was enormous. Why? Um, yeah, she's enormous. <laughs> A real dwarven woman of color cast. Why would they go to this incredibly large woman? <laughs> is it possible that they that um, dwarves of color don't exist? And it, well, I haven't seen them. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I guess I personally have never seen a dwarven woman of color. I, I've heard the legends, of course, and I heard them from a woman, so I do believe them. Um, so maybe that's what it is. Maybe you're going to have just. Get on oh, Google part. and try to see if this is. Uh... Yeah, Jess, could you, do you? Would you mind? And I don't mean to mansplain, but maybe Google that. See if there is. I don't mean such a mind. thing as a uh, a dwarven woman of color. Because if yeah. not, then they'd have to um, cast someone who's yeah, hided. Then it's, then it's uh, the next. Who's hided? Thing, and then it's uh, very understandable. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So we. So there are. They do exist. And <laughs> this makes, I'm very. I'm blown away and not in the good auto blow way. This is terrible. <laughs> I apologize. Auto blow family. Shit. Right? Be... Okay, now do me do me one favor and compare. I've got another clip. Yo, do set internet live so I can be sad. Oh, compared to that. No, yeah, I was gonna say like if, if I want to compare like what's funny to not funny. Um, no, compare. Listen, funny. Jen, I want to just notice that. Maybe something about that introduction was probably emotional triggering for you. How is that not the same interview? <laughs> like, it was like, just listen to any time Delin talks here. And I don't want to ignore that. So, are you comfortable sharing kind of what you're feeling right now? I don't mean to put you on this part, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 
this is evil because I'm laughing at this. Okay. I'll her. be okay. I just need this. <laughs> no. I'll cut out her, Ryan. I'm so sorry. Oh I, my God. Listen. I'm so sorry. And thank you, Jen, for being willing uh, to do this. Be vulnerable. Um, this is super hard and sensitive stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Are you not watching the same show? Oh my God. Are you not this watching is, the same show? Um, is, thank you, Jen. This thank is you, Jen. pornographic. Like this is emotional <laughs> vulnerability rape porn. Like people are into emotional vulnerability. Like, oh, I just want to see it taken out of her. Like that's what he's somebody, doing. I think like, John Lynn is is look a, at the camera, like honey. A, look at the camera, honey, while you sniffle. <laughs> John Lynn is like a Reddit a redditor who like put so somebody put like fifteen thousand hours of Brene Brown into an AI and said, use this to <laughs> use this to exploit people, <laughs> and then John Lynn was created. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff, man. Like, see, oh, whenever God. they whenever they interact with the woman here. Yes. Just put a Thrive hat on uh, Metzger right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if Jessica is also on a sex strike. Oh, <laughs> she, if she could get pregnant, and then what, what would she do? Yes. Jess, are you, I, are you on a sex strike, uh, Jess? Um, because what would you do I, if you got pregnant? What would you do? I'd just drink a six pack of beer and ride a roller, roller coaster. <laughs> Resourceful. <laughs> well, then, then she around the block for uh, Disneyland. And <laughs> more gets out. Um, so let's get some of your mantonements going. Well, I'd like to just add another uh, way that I'm mantoning. Let me see whatever. Speak up a little bit. Um, which Michael needs to speak up? One with the glasses. Oh, Michael. Yes, turn your microphone up, Michael. Sorry. My microphone's up. Uh, pretty high, but I'm not going to question Jessica, who's a woman. Uh, let me go ahead and get that mic. I know you don't want to feel uh, too aggressive, but if they can't hear you, they can't learn. I'm Anton for being logical and reasonable. <laughs> works. See, I listen to this on my way it's to work. Big. It's so funny. Man, oh, they really nail it. It's you the know, same tones to me, exactly. But... I mean, that seems like, because, like, this isn't, you know, there's no money in this for us, but we have a little bit of situation, like, with actual Justice Warrior, where he's like, you know, like, if it wasn't for the Young Turks continually producing <laughs> stuff, we'd have nothing to talk about, like, and John DeLynn is our version of that, where it's like, oh my god, like, he just, he's a continuous fountain of stupidity. It's really amazing. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can whip out random moral philosophy, but we haven't even barely tippy touched into Kara, but there's other podcasts too. But what my complaint was, and it wasn't those last ones, is that like Delin and Larson, they really do kind of set the Overton window of ex-Mormon, of ex-Mormon vlogging and talking. And there's, there's some sort of sense that, I don't know, people do become Delinites when they, when they turn into ex-Mormons in a weird way. And that's, yeah. that's what drives well, me nuts. So. I mean, because that's the thing. It's like, what do you do? Okay, so you figured out the church isn't true. Okay, well, that's done. Unless you make that into your new faith. That's what Delin says. Yeah. You know? It's literally that. You know? Because, like, just that. I mean, you know, don't... Like, that's the thing. Is his thing isn't, like, walk away and leave it alone. He said, walk away, but don't leave it alone. Yeah, go back and work your way yeah. back in, as Larson said, or... We got to take them on and make them change and make them get taken over by the technocrats because we're going to you know, make them yeah, call. Like, I'm on. perfectly happy to walk away and leave it alone. As like, cause I, I don't know, like I've said before, I never went through that. I hate Mormonism, tear it all down. I don't like any of it. Like, you know, I, de I definitely I did. <laughs> yeah. See, I can't make good funeral potatoes. And so if it wasn't for Mormon funerals, when would I have good <laughs> God, I love funeral potatoes. Like, yeah, no, exactly. Like, and that's the thing is like, so I'm fortunate and I've got a lot of elderly Mormon relatives. So I got a lot of delicious baked cornflake casserole coming my way. Yeah. No, it's you gotta you're treading on blessings, John Delin. You're you're treading on dangerous ground here because <laughs> because you tell Mormons that hey, maybe you tell ex-Mormons that hey, maybe the best idea is 
actually to leave the church and just leave it alone. <laughs> they'll, yeah. they'll be like, "Fuck you!" I don't like because that's the other thing is like, I don't, I don't know because there's there's the part where it's like, "Well, no, fuck you! It's mine. My Mormon heritage is mine, and if I want to keep with it and play with it, it's mine. It's my damn toy." And because like one of the things I always joke about is that because like everywhere I've ever lived in my post Mormon world that I've made coffee. Everybody's complained that I made bad coffee, and and I totally <laughs> copied. It. My joke is is that that is like you know like like the monkey paws curse of living leaving Mormonism. The Mormon God cursed me personally by making it so that I can't make good coffee. That's my <laughs> you know, and everybody gets like every ex Mormon gets a Mormon curse. In, in my belief, you know, my curse is I can't make good coffee. I think everybody has to find out what is your thing. That the Mormon God was right about, and he's trying to show you you were wrong. The Mormon God was uh... right about eating <laughs> eating well, but he should have forced me to do it because then I would have done yeah. it. All right, it's time for does it say? How long are we going here? Do we have an end time? We're about done. Just as soon as we make some okay, make make some guesses. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> well, I mean, torn jeans. That's... I'm gonna have to say bad. She looks <laughs> like I just going with your gut. That she she looks like a douche. Well, no, okay. Two hundred and sixty-nine thousand so, likes. Well, real quick, because like how much time did she spend on that eyeshadow? <laughs> well, I'm just and, looking at like her like, like, hair is resting on, on the strings. Because that thing's like this girl, it's like if for every if, if you spent half of the time you spent on eyeshadow on scales <laughs> <laughs> but let's see what happens <laughs> that is not all good. right okay see that's the thing i don't why don't they like if you're gonna do that riff what do like there's a little takes. bit there's a little bit better Choose timing. The best one. Her timing went weird in there a little bit, too, a couple times, and both of them, like, yeah, she plays well enough that she could have done it better. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. but like, because so, what's the weird phenomenon there? Because that thing is like, there are ten thousand boys her age learning to play the guitar at about her level. Do do they make TikToks of themselves? And if so, what happens? Are they made fun of? Or is it just ignored? Or do they even bother? Like, there's really a fascinating, like, psychological, human evolutionary psychology thing going on there with the young girls and the tech doctor. And also, <laughs> who's buying them all these great guitars? <laughs> Nobody I mean... bought me a great guitar. I blame men. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not even kidding. I Who blame, doesn't? It's I the blame, simps. It's the simps. I usually don't, though. Like, I, this is one of those instances where this feels like men's fault. <laughs> that's, that's the is audience. She really, is she really left handed or is this just a reversed video? I don't know. I can't, can't tell. tell. But, like, this is men's fault because they watch this shit and it's, I, I, might have explained this last time it's the the gamer girl syndrome where they're just like whoa are you like i i used to do this online this online game on steam where i you, i chose the username you could change it whenever you want i just chose a woman's name just because <laughs> people treat you differently and they're oh yeah yeah i've done that before they're immediately like are are you really a girl? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> it's so cool when <laughs> girls like that? games. Oh, hell yeah. I've done that yeah. all the time. They, no, they give you everything you yeah. want. I'm like, this game take. I know this game takes forever to like get all of the resources that I need. So if I just have a woman's name, they'll give me anything. They'll be like, here's money in the game and, and experience and all this shit. And I'll let you rank up or whatever. But uh, yeah. <laughs> So this is men's fault. As soon as they see a gamer girl, they're like, well, you're so cool because you game. It's same with guitars. They'll be like, yeah, not a lot of girls play guitars. Like, no, every yeah. fucking girl plays guitar. Like, it's... All of them <laughs> know how to do a G chord. That's... They could play but, every Taylor Swift song. Because, like, I mean, there's... Because there's the other thing going on here. I mean, it's the thing that, like, girls have always been playing dumb about, 
which is like, oh, really? You did your hair and makeup to get ready <laughs> to practice guitar. I did That's for myself, okay. I don't mm -hmm. look I don't look good <clears throat> for you. I look good for oh, me. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you came home from school and you had a rough day. So you just got all gussied up. To yes, run some I cakes. lounge. Yes, I lounge around in done up hair, full makeup, yeah. and a thong. I like, do that because be it's like, comfortable. Do, do, <laughs> yeah, but like it would be fun to do the experiment of like, okay, every other time, like wear the same shirt, even just like don't do your hair and makeup, and and do a scale and see what happens. <laughs> good or not good? Um, I don't know. No. She looks nice. I hope she's good. Oh, she doesn't have enough likes. I mean, to be, th that's to why I was bad. like, I mean, I was doing, <laughs> there's kind of a little bit of Sherlock Holmes in this with the left handed guitar. If it's truly a left handed yeah, guitar, she, it's, she's probably, yeah, good there's something to actually obtaining to a left handed out. guitar. Yeah. Like, because you can find a, re you can trip over right handed guitar. Don't let me down. Guy. I'm voting good. <laughs> oh, fuck. You can't even see her. No, no. Okay, uh, I, I, I guess in her no. defense, I, I don't know how much of that <laughs> is the mic. Because <laughs> that sounds like it was recorded on a flip phone. Well, no, no, because like, obviously a lot of these girls are using a lot of like drive and chorus and other sexifying guitar effects. And I don't mean like sexifying as in the human sexy, but in the guitar tone sexy. But like, yeah, that sounded awful. Like, I mean, if if you were gonna use that stereo phase effect, at least <laughs> time the loops better. Here's our favorite one. We already know. Oh, it's one. her. See if you see, know. See, see, even if we even if we didn't have the Lynn, we'd still have her. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we got Mel, baby, or whatever. Get a go, go, number one. Take a ride from anyone. Look at that. That's the thing that always gets me is the gauge on her strings. She's just doing like first position hard strumming and she picks strings that are like <laughs> the whole time. They're like <laughs> slapping against the fretboard. What's the right? Pulls away. I don't know that song. Am I supposed to know that song? Uh, it sounds so. familiar, but she says that she's like, do you recognize this song? And it's so all like, the simps in the comments can be like, I recognize it. Touch my like, pee-pee. It's like, where it's like, just, I mean, whatever. She's going to do what she's going to do. But I want to be like, okay, do you really, like, is this a thing you want to do? Do you want to play guitar and be a performer? Because, like, you've got the building blocks there. But, like, what you're doing isn't that. Like, you need to work a lot more and you need to stop thinking about TikTok and start thinking about putting the bigger pieces together. But like, cause like she's not without talent. Like, you know, she's kind of yelling there, but like a little bit of coaching, you know, listening back to herself, she can sing, why not? And she's clearly playing the guitar, but like, I almost think it's like, you're distracting yourself by taking off your shirt before you do this. <laughs> like, you obviously me, have the Let me drape goal. this coffee table doily over my shoulders. Because, like, no, like, seriously, like, because, like, honestly, like, okay, girl, if you want to make money with your body, I'm sure you can go on to OnlyFans right now, and, and you don't even have to put a guitar in the shot, and you'll do better, you I'll know? just do both. But, like, like, if you want to be a guitar player singer, do that. But... The whole I'm half naked while doing it thing is distracting. Knock it off. Focus on one thing or the other. So we started out talking about women in the past in the movie Prey being able to beat the Predator and they're coming over into men's spaces and all that stuff. And the red letter media guys, even then, they're starting to simp for him. But let's go back to 1944 to this uh -huh. lady who was Carmen Amaya, the, the greatest flamenco dancer ever and the first woman to master this intricate footwork originally reserved for males does she suck or is she good <laughs> tiktok good. she's just doing it for the tiktok vids man she's just showing her cleavage it's a 1944 tiktok <laughs> 1944 <laughs> tiktok and it's just a matter of cleavage yeah. look at these guys just looking at her cleavage a film camera cost as much as like a neighborhood of housing <laughs> Uh, 
shots. These are crazy. I don't care what she does if she doesn't take off her shirt. Yeah, fuck <laughs> it's off. just for the TikTok. Fuck views. off. Show us just, your tits. <laughs> I just saw it was showing Sam Harris was trending. I saw that, yeah. The rapidity at which her leg could go from completely straight to a 90 degree angle was amazing. <laughs> this this lady is one of the uh the um Southern Baptist Wokies who's bringing in all the Wokies to the Southern Baptist convention stuff. Oh god, that's like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> I love Jesus. I love scripture. I like people. I like, I like people. diversity. <laughs> My no, I love that. Like, I love Jesus. I love scripture. I like people. <laughs> My interactions and follows do not equal endorsement of. Oy. How do I get back to what? Why is Sam Harris trending? Oh, no. There he is. Simon Rushdie made me sad. I know. Or he might survive. Why is he it trending? Like he'll... Is he trending because he's next on the fatwa? I'm guessing. Why? There's nothing going on. Just because of Salmon, Salmon Rushdie's trending? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's just talking about Salmon Rushdie. Oh. Oh, I know why he was uh, why he was trending. Because a, a while recently, he came out admitting that he got Trump deranged and all that stuff, right? And now with this new FBI raid, he did? even after he did it, yeah, he, supposedly he admitted. He said, yeah, I kind of fell and got like swamped, like whipped up and that stuff. And then I saw some people talking that with this FBI raid, he, he immediately just jumped right back into it. Like, whoa, <laughs> Trump's the evil super devil. <laughs> you know? what? He, he, just, he just buys the, the thing of a... Because uh, yeah, 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 like, I just struggle to imagine, like, what could he possibly want with that? What would it be? It's not that. Like, it's not that. Yeah, that's what it is. It's not yeah, that. That's, that's what I figure, yeah. like it, Because it, it doesn't make sense. Like, I'm, I know very, very, very little about this. But I've read quite a bit about like the nuclear missile silos and how that whole thing works and like and i just don't believe that there's a fucking piece of paper in the oval <laughs> office that you can take and be like hey, password 22 Putin, we launched wanna... nuclear weapons now <laughs> yeah. yeah turns out the password was password <laughs> stupid american <laughs> yeah it's not that what it's just well, the All guy at work, stupid I, narrative. The guy at work that was talking to me about it today was explaining that, like, he, like, yeah, the running theory is that he was trying to sell it to Saudi Arabia, and I was like, that's not Trump's mo. Like, he's an asshole. He's so probably a narcissist. Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Like, but then he's like, well, they gave Jared Kushner a lot of money a while back, and and they had this big golf tournament on Trump's golf course, and. That's where the exchange could have happened. It's like, what exchange? The secrets were still in his house, weren't they? The other thing is, like, if you tell me that, like, oh, the Saudi Arabian royal family in the guise of the Saudi Arabian government is buying influence by donating and colluding with Republican officials, I'd be like, okay, it makes perfect sense. Which is why I always ask people, it's one of my favorite things to ask Democrats, because and I genuinely don't have an answer to this question. This isn't a got you. It's just something I've wondered. Which is, what exactly does the Clinton Foundation do with all that <laughs> money from the Saudi royal family? And what does the Saudi royal family expect to get from donating to the Clinton Foundation? Because the Clinton Foundation says that it's about spreading gender equality around the world. Now I happen to know <laughs> Saudi Arabia. Has they, uh, with... It's so funny because like, there exactly was a... going on there. I really, I genuinely don't know who. There was what, whistleblowers who, who blew a whistle on on the Clinton Foundation not paying their taxes or filing them oh, correctly at all. Don't say. Well, and I there don't was... remember where I saw, but somebody mentioned that like uh, the donations to the Clinton Foundation went down by eighty percent as soon as it was clear that Hillary lost the election. Hmm. Which is like okay, well, so I. That looks like the Clinton paying Foundation for influence. Is, just, is just paying for access. Yeah, it's literally mm. just paying for access to Clintons. It's also right. obvious. I mean, the Pelosi stuff. I mean, I, how? Yeah. Even, like I said, even Elizabeth Warren came out saying, okay, <laughs> people inside in the House and the Senate should not be able to be making trades. And, and I don't know how anybody can sit there and look at that and think that that. Are you going to? 
Are you going to cut in Tyler Dunnigan's Nancy? I'll pass a law. I'll pass some laws. I, I, I hear a little. I, I'll I pass some laws. A little bird tells me I'll pass. See, I just sound like a southerner. How do you if you want to make laws? some money, why don't you just pass, pass some laws? Pass a law. How do we do pass, that? How do we sound like that? It gives like an R to law. it. A law. Why don't you pass? We don't have any money. How about you pass some laws? <laughs> I remember I earlier that. when you said this wasn't going to go over an, over an hour. You promised. Yeah, I keep promising. But I'm still having fun. <laughs> I need to go to bed soon. But Here we go. Okay, that, it. that's it. With me, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> just in time for the lightning round. <laughs> just a skeleton hand. <laughs> would be a lure against a lure. people trading that's a lure. Stocks, but there's we just haven't gotten around to it. Okay, let's get back shit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, from Toledo, you're on. Booyah, Nancy. Booyah. <laughs> your husband bought Google just before the antitrust bill vote? You guys made $5 million? Mm-hmm. So was that like luck? Or... Yes, it was a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, George Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mark from Illinois. <laughs> Booyah. Hey, should I uh, position before the EV bill passes? Sell, sell, sell. That was easy. A little birdie told me I'll be voting the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you newbies at home, don't be discouraged. I lost a lot of money in the market, but things really turned around when I started making lures. <laughs> I'm going to jingle all my jewelry in your face. You'll like it. <laughs> 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 oh, God damn. Like, I just funny like, I compare him, like, that was a minute and 23 seconds. And, like, I think about, like, I probably have, I and, like, and I'm not even paying attention, but in, like, a decade, I have probably seen 30 minutes of SNL cold opens, and I've laughed maybe once. <laughs> you know? Like, I was trying to explain really... that to a guy at work who was, like, we were arguing about Family Guy today. <laughs> Or oh, yesterday, boy. and and I I was like, dude, I don't know. He kept trying to get me to watch. It. I was like, Family Guy hasn't made me laugh in like thirteen years. Yeah. And even when I go back and watch the old stuff, it's not as good as when I was ten. You know. And he's like, he's like, well, you know, I mean, it it it'll it'll make you. You just give it a shot, and it it's a show that it'll consistently it'll make you chuckle. A couple times per episode, and I was like, "That's yeah. not no. worth it." I'm not even. <laughs> Why there. would like, I do that? I think in Belly Laugh at South Park for episodes I've seen yeah. a million. Oh God, this is crazy. Dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, like I kind of like it's almost become a game with me. It's like an undrinking game. Time. How long can I watch Family Guy without laughing? <laughs> <laughs> Better not be too loud. Would hate to admit that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that would be stranger than the time you thought bird is the word was hilarious. <laughs> Where did the sound go? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Here's a, here's a question. Actually, um, is old Greg funny? Who? Old Greg. The oh, the pedophile can, guy. You'd be more surprised than the time you. It's a sketch. It's a sketch from and everyone saw me fight that chicken for the all 17th the time, but time. All they ever quote is, "I'm old Greg. I like to drink Bailey's from a shoe." And oh, that's on. I don't that's... remember if it. It might have been the whitest kids you know. But huh. um, I don't know that reference. Oh, it was Maybe really big a long time with ago. my friends, and it's so... I control what they I, do You didn't me. think it was funny and everybody They're else? They're gonna milk me for Yeah. It, which is crazier than the time we joked about... The Mighty Boosh. Meg. See, I haven't watched The Mighty Boosh. I, a lot yeah. of people tell me I should, but I never have. You will never the be Mighty satisfied. Boosh? Everything yeah. will disappoint you. Isn't that... It's an Australian show, I think, that was on Adult Swim. Oh. I don't, I don't know. It just... But yeah, Family Guy, like, I feel like, because, you know, like, they've made hundreds of episodes. I feel like if I went through, I could pick through a couple dozen that I think are like, well, that's, you know, a solid show with, like, a story and jokes that I laugh at. But 
yeah, like especially like the last twenty years of Family Guy. Like <laughs> I don't know, there's nothing. I really just there. haven't. Wa- I haven't really watched much of it. I don't know what this old Greg is. Have you guys yeah, seen? Yeah. Have you guys watched? Oh. This isn't funny, but have you guys watched Primal by uh, that Teddy? Uh, what's his name? The dude who does uh, Samurai Jack. Mm-hmm. No, Getty Tarkovsky. Prim- yeah. Watch his new show, Primal, on HBO. It, it's a show about an old caveman, and uh, he makes a Tyrannosaurus his pet. And the thing almost brought me to tears several times. So is it a cartoon? Good. Yeah. Is it's, it? Yeah, because, I mean, it must be if it's Gendy. I've got something. I've got something. Come to Papa Moon. That's it. Come on. Oh. So this, this is what's your friend's thoughts funny, and you don't think it's funny. It's I don't know if this is the whole thing. It's the thing I said was always a lot longer than this, but yeah, I haven't watched them. I don't know. A lot of people say it's really good, but I've never watched it. This is primal. Watch it. It's so good. There's only like a season. So Gendy Tartakovsky is a genuine artist. That guy's special. It's it's so harsh. And funny and sad and heartbreaking, like all that stuff. What is it? And it's awesome too, the fighting is awesome. Oh, that's he reminds me so much of Kurosawa. The way he does the most thing- movement. Most- well, then all the stuff that happens, too, is like... like... I really think that whole anime thing about, like, the characters being still in the shot with the background moving, like, came yeah. out of Kurosawa. Oh, oh yeah. Really? So there's all this stuff, because, like, there's all this action that goes on, but, like, I'm telling you, like, you'll tear up several different times, and it will be stuff, like... Like that, it just showed them killing that old woolly mammoth, right? Well, mm-hmm. that woolly mammoth had been walking through the cold for a while, and it got to this point where it showed the woolly mammoth go through this big long walk, this difficult time, and all this stuff. And he got to this area where he's just like, I just can't go anymore, and he just you feel all sad for him. And then our heroes jump out and attack him, <laughs> right? And you're like, why did we just have that whole intro showing like the struggle of that woolly mammoth first? You know what I mean? And so then, like, I, I was introduced by to Gendy Kartatovsky and one of those things where it's like, you know, just turn the TV on late at night. And I just had that moment like, wait, what is this? And before I knew it, like, I was just totally sucked in. And it was a Samurai Jack episode with no dialogue. Like, the yeah. guy is... There's no a, dialogue a in the movie. Stri- oh, he, yeah, he's a brilliant visual storyteller. He's one of the best. Absolutely. It, it's so good. And it literally, like, not just once or twice, even just kind of whole different concepts because different concepts come up in different episodes. And probably over three different times, and I don't, I don't tear up easily. Three, four times, he almost teared me up. So, damn. Um, yeah, watch it; it's good. Anyway, anything we w- we want to add on? I, uh... Um, I have a few not podcasty point of orders, but what did you name dog? That What's is, Doggo called? That's Carlito Cafe. Carlito <laughs> I Cafe. thought you were joking. <laughs> it's Charlie oh, okay, Brown. I thought you were too. Charlie Brown, <laughs> Carlito Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's brilliant. So you're just getting one this time, and you you found a breed. Yeah, we can do it. He's, he's smart. Trouble. Yeah, he's Border Collie, like one fourth uh, Australian Shepherd and rest Border did, Collie. He should you be never smart. got? <laughs> did you ever get telepathic communication on video with Stu and Sadie? No, I should have. I, I actually got something because one of the cool things they do on TikTok, which you should be watching if you haven't seen them, is there's all sorts of videos where really good musicians will make music to animals and to animals oh. making different sounds. And I've got some video of uh, my Jack Russell playing the piano because he That's he'd always a good uh, I've seen that he'd get up and play the piano. And there's all sorts of guys on TikTok who would probably like turn that into. They could turn that into like a full song. I just wish that we had proof because, like, to try to describe how telepathic communication actually went down with Stu and Sadie, like, I just feel like people wouldn't believe how it worked. But it was yeah. such an amazing thing. Yeah, I didn't have to say or tell them anything, and they didn't yeah, know no, when I... it was time to go out for a walk. I said, like, "Well, 
watch it. They're gonna... yeah, and, and you taught me how to do it. I got to where I could communicate with them telepathically about walking. It was amazing. See, I have a, can... a Brazil question for Jared. Did Brazil you have question. biscoito? Did you those those uh, tapioca puffs that they love down there? They they're like shaped like peanuts and they come with different flavors. I'm but they're like sure you know they're that... to, to, the de manjoca. I don't know, that you remember sounds... that stuff. That sounds like they're to ubiquitous the in Minas Gerais in the south. I can't remember where you were. I um, was very very far south. I was just, I was Porto Alegre. Yeah, so. you, must, you must you must have run into these things because you know tapioca is in everything. Like you had pão de queijo, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a lot yeah, of okay. that. Because like I took I took these to work, and it's funny because like I like because most Americans like most Brazilian things, but those tapioca are funny because like like one in four people are just like no. But <laughs> so listen to this. Don't have enough time remembering. <laughs> this sounds like if Yoko Ono had a sense of rhythm. <laughs> That's the stuff, kind of stuff guys gotta do. Can't just pull how out many the vote, How many views did they get next to Canadian Bikini Girl? <laughs> uh, they got 3,000 views, 4,000 <laughs> views. Or those Meanwhile, are there's, there's that girl that sold her farts in a jar for $50,000 or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> yeah. She's a marketing mm -hmm. genius, okay? There's, <laughs> there's a market full of simps and she tapped into it and I hate her for it, but... Oh my God, a little retarded dog. There's a lot of there's a lot of these videos. There's a lot of different channels of people who get, make really good stuff. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, huskies are good for it. <laughs> Why does this song stink? What he oh uh, yeah, he emo did. song on the road? What? Yes, he writes yeah. his emo song. Fucking brilliant, features. absolutely brilliant. I, that one. Sad, I wish that's you that's why the song's called "Sad This Summer." <laughs> I'm sad this summer. I'm so mad this summer. summer. He nails the, the whiny he Tom really Delonge does. voice too. He absolutely does. I TikTok stuff gets amazing because like not just one person like none of these people don't coordinate like the first one drops and it's this one and then somebody else comes in and, <laughs> and then they, they add it and it's this one and they just layer them and layer them like there's there's amazingly creative stuff that happens on there. <laughs> so 
So I, I want to put on my dog playing the piano on there and see what what uh like, if it gets some like, attention of people. Better, like, because I know whole people like like have devoted like entire lives to like recording their albums of their like serious <laughs> work, and like that just little fuck off thing is better than like the output. <laughs> like some people's entire lifetimes output doesn't even compare to that little piece of brilliance right there. <laughs> oh my god, Thank I wanted you. to. Just, the, the thing I almost want to show you guys is no, I will maybe save for another time. There's a bizarre thing I heard that like I just want to talk about, but it's just too weird. What? No, let me send, tell you what, I'll send you the link <laughs> just because it's such a weird, stupid, creepy thing. This is a this is my dog playing. Maybe we can get get some TikTokers to. To do at this. Got a piano player. Does my parents' house not kind of just scream Mormon? Oh yeah, very much. I don't know, <laughs> if you're not Mormon, could you like not see that house and like not kind of just it doesn't even need <laughs> yeah. like Christian stuff in it and you know. <laughs> yeah, you can't even what see the magazine. Oh, Good geez. boy. Damn. <laughs> He's actually got a goal there. <laughs> I saw Stu's little sister, because Stu's little sister, Sadie, loved to play with the sprinkler. Sadie knew how to turn the sprinkler on by manipulating the... She the knew how to roll the down clothes. the windows in the car, too. She was... Did you get that crazy. link I sent you? You got you got Sadie hooked on beer though. Let's see. <laughs> oh yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she knew how to hunt for him. Biscuitos. Was this a song? Yeah, play that song. You don't have to play all of it, but. Spies are listening. Not crying. To what you're typing. So this song has a whole bunch of views on YouTube, not because it's any good or because it's any particularly bad, but because it was written by one of the guys that got busted on To Catch a Predator by Chris Hansen. N -uh. <laughs> and he wrote a song about it called Thought Crime. Oh no, my no. gosh. No, he's just a victim. And if you listen to the whole thing in that context, it becomes funny. And the thing is, like, <laughs> it becomes Holy funny. <laughs> the comments, oh my the God. comments are all just people quoting famous lines from predators on that show. So, anyway, good Alrighty. stuff. There's good stuff out there. Sorry we didn't solve the atheism thing again. <laughs> ah, nuts. Again? We'll, fix, we'll fix morality someday. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe little Carlito Cafe can do it for us. It ultimately just is is like empiricists. If you're gonna hold to empiricism and not be postmodernist and the religious, if you're still gonna hold on to some reality at the base of your abstractions, we should all be able to get along. We should all be able to watch Venture Brothers together and yeah. Primal. Fuck yeah. So, mm -hmm. Groovy. Right on. All right. All right. Later. See you, man.